I think we're live now. This is my radio voice. Really I'll turn on everybody. Sorry. Um, so tonight we're starting all about Wulong. Um, and uh, this is here live at uh, Floating Mountain Tea House in Manhattan's Upper West Side. Uh, if you find yourself in the New York City area, this is a must go place. Um, some people here might be here the first time. A lot of recurring faces I see in these events as well as in our weekly meditation sessions, as well as just our everyday sit down, let's have some tea kind of thing. It's a beautiful Chinese style tea house with lots and lots of Chinese style teas. And tonight we'll be talking all about at least one type of those panoply of teas. Uh, tonight we'll be talking all about oolong. So um, questions that came up and we'll, we'll pull people in from the both live in tea house audience as well as our live online audience, but um, the question came up was, what's oolong? And specifically, what's oolong? Why the U, the W and the U? Um, isn't it O-O long? Um, we'll jump right into that, so. Any other questions before we jump in? I think that's silly thing. Okay, so we have our kettle getting ready to boil. We're gonna go through this wonderful little slideshow, and I'll try to keep it short and sweet. I like to talk. Um, and then we'll jump into some beautiful teas that were sourced uh, both by Lena Medieva, who's the proprietor here at Floating Mountain Tea House, um, as well as some that I've had just personally collected and sourced. So first and foremost, we're not gonna go through this overview. So sorry. Slow down your YouTube video if you want right here. Play it at, what is it, 0.5? and you'll be able to watch this. But let's first just jump into what is Wulong? Um, when we look at the name Wulong, here are the Chinese characters for it, we have three characters. Um, can anybody tell me if they know any of these? Specifically, maybe this one? I know Cha. You know Cha, <laughs> yeah. I know the word Cha. You, you know the word Cha? Yeah. Okay. What's that? Dragon. And, and then there's Dragon right here, right? So we have Dragon Tea, that's pretty cool. Um, so why do we know cha? Well, cha is tea. Uh, cha is, is tea, and the term cha refers specifically to Camellia sinensis. This is an evergreen shrub. Um, you'll see them in anywhere from topiary gardens to botanical gardens to just growing wild if you go into jungle and sort of evergreen forests in China and East Asia. Um, only one of those and I'll piss a lot of people off in the internet world for saying this, but only one of those is a true tea plant, uh, Camellia sinensis. There's ca Camellia japonica, there are all these various different versions of Camellia. There's even one called Camellia sinensis uh, asamica, um, and that's what goes into things like Assam varietal teas. But this is the tea when we think of, or this is a plant when we think of tea, this green, sometimes black, sometimes brown, sometimes red, a little leaf that in this case has been rolled into a little pellet. Um, when you go to a place like China, Korea, Japan specifically, um, those three, um, when people say cha, when people say tea, that's what they're referring to. Why do we call it tea? Well, at some point, you know, the Dutch came into uh, uh, Fujian, and they had people serve them this beverage. And they're like, what is this thing called? And they're like, te, because that's what the local dialect would be saying, it's te. And by that, they picked up tea. Um, other cultures that came into China earlier, um, whether they're the Portuguese, they came in through the south. What do you call tea there? They call it cha. And so when you go to Portugal, tea is, what is it? Something close to cha. I can't pronounce Portuguese. <laughs> uh, a little bit more go. Um, when you go to places like uh, India, all of a sudden people call it chai. Well, what's close to India? Parts of China that call tea cha. So they, it's a sort of change that we get um, throughout. Um, and even the word, if you look at some of my other videos online or if you come in and, and sit in, in one of these, little informational series, a history in a bowl of tea, we talk about the term tea and how that even changed. So now that we've figured out what tea is, this 
this green, evergreen uh, shrub that flowers, beautiful little flowers. Um, has a little bit of caffeine, has a little bit of tannins, all these other things. Um, but what's going on over here? And we first said, well, we have dragon here, right? But then we got this character. What is this? Uh, ooh, uh, sometimes uh, written as ooh, double O, um, refers to the color black. And the color black in, in Chinese uh, language can be many different things. Um, but this is one of them. And it refers to the, the color of a black crow, or sometimes like a black cloud. So you'll say, oh, it's really dark outside. Some people will say it's like a, a wu yun, which is like a black cloud. Um, but a wu ya is like a black duck or a black crow. That's what they're referring to. It's a sort of shiny, slick, you know, pure black um, versus other types of black. Um, and then long, which is this dragon character. Why do we call it that? Well, there's some theories around that. Um, one is if you pick up a tea leaf, and we're gonna pick up one and pass it around. What color is that tea leaf? Um, I would say dark brown. Dark brown. brown, yeah. Hmm. Love you, that's fine. Yeah, we're not there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay, all right. And, and for, <laughs> if, if you wanna sort of like imagine when you look at that shape, when you think of, you know, put yourself in the mind of someone who's living in a world where, you know, at least from a sort of mythological standpoint, you were living in a world of dragons, of, uh, you know, phoenixes, of, you know, golden sea turtles, things like that. They're gonna give a poetic name and attribute the look of something to what, you know, kind of poetically or mythologically it might be point to. So when you look at one of these little twisted curly leaves, I don't know if you'll see, um, what's really nice about that is that it kind of looks like a little dragon. So it's a little black dragon. This is, this is black dragon teeth. I have a question. Yeah. Okay, so I've heard a rumor, unsubstantiated possibly, yes. that like if a tea is named like dragon or like monkey or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. it's like more high quality. Is that a thing or... Are so, like competition grade teas like usually named like something like a dragon? This is a very fair and excellent question. Um, historically, they tend to give these things poetic names. Again, they try to allude to like natural aspects. Um, tea grows in the wild. It grows in places that are where monkeys might live, where dragons might hide. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, the imagination goes and attributes all of this to it. We have some teas that are called shui xian, and that's referring to like a, a mountain spirit or a mountain immortal, and that's somebody you know who you might meet in the mountains as you're picking tea. Um, so does it attribute quality though? Now, as we'll talk about when it comes to tea, tea is one of the first, I would say, things in the world that was heavily marketed. And the name itself was one of those sort of demarcators of quality. So if I'm saying my tea is, you know, and we'll talk about it, like the big red rope, uh, or the monkey pick, you know, mountain, uh, uh, what do you want to call that, the iron bodhisattva, you know, these are real tea names. Um, monkey pick is, is literal, right? Like they used to train monkeys to... No. Okay. No, but, it, but that's the thing. <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like, it makes the imagination go. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I want to try it at least. I don't know. Was it monkey pick? Maybe I'll find some monkey fur. Um, <laughs> who knows? You'll find second tea sometimes. Um, so it, it leads the mind to go like, I want to know more. And that's kind of the cool thing about tea. Um, but does it, does it mean quality per se? Depends. And we'll talk about where we find quality in tea because that's, that I think is more about, okay, I'm going to listen to your story. But does it add up, you know? And that's, let's always keep our critical thinking hats on when we approach tea, when we approach, you know, different things like that, because there's a lot to learn in these little leaves. So like a monkey picked, I mm. mean, is that like a very traditional name or is that like more like a modern marketing tool? It's a traditional name. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So even back in the day, they were like, you know. Oh yeah. 
they yeah. sell in the story. Yeah, okay. big time. And a lot of these teas will have names that are like, I'm going to tell you a tale. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. That's stuff. Yeah. For, for the, the Wu character, yeah. is that, like, it looks very similar, and maybe it's just my imagination, mm-hmm. to like horse? Yeah, yeah. You have some of the wrathful here is the same. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, a bit it's nothing, it's nothing to do with that. Well, like, it's just... When, when you look at the, this is sort of a, a outside tea, but also very much part of tea, a uh, literary question or language question. Whenever you see these four little dots here, it means it's usually something that has uh, mobility, okay. um, usually by way of either legs or in some cases uh, by fin. So okay. you'll see that. Um, this whole part is probably part of the you know, body structure, and then this part is specific to the animal. So horse is a little bit different. Ma is a little bit different. Okay. So, yeah. These are all good questions. Cool. I've never had to answer that question <laughs> as, I, as I talk it's about it. It's just the one thing that I recognize. So. Yeah. Um, Chinese language is, you know, again, a pictoform based language. And as the language and the way you write it changes, um, some things are brought and kept, some things are thrown away. When you look at tea itself, you have what's called a grass radical sitting on top. So think of grass. Think of maybe a person or sometimes like a little shed or roof. And then right here, you have tree. So all of a sudden, what are we thinking when we look at this without even knowing what this is? Cha. We're thinking of something that's plant-based. We're thinking of something that's either, you know, touched by human uh, hands or, you know, being cultivated, um, but it itself is a tree. And we'll look at some tea plants later in the slideshow. If we go there. Um, <laughs> if the um, computer says that. Yeah, it's like, come on. <laughs> um, um, but what's great about that is that this also leads us to sort of interrogate history, because Chinese language is very, very old. We'll still stop touring a little bit on what tea is. Um, it's kind of hard to make out the colors here, but we have a spectrum of teas, all right? So we have that plant. We have that little evergreen plant. We picked it. What happens next? We just put it in our mouths. Maybe if we're like a mountain sage, we might, and we'll get a little caffeine kick. Um, people still do that. I go to tea farms. I eat a little bit of tea, uh, tea leaf, and I'm ready to run around that mountain. Um, I have a question on caffeine. Yeah. Is it true that if you steep tea once, uh-huh. it loses most of its caffeine? If you steep it again, then it's just mostly flavor? There's, there's yes and no. Okay. Um, so a lot of the caffeine is going to exist on the close to the surface. Okay. Um, tannins generally sit on the surface. Caffeine sits a little bit more in the body of the plant. But yes, a lot of it comes out. Um, so if you do want to decaffeinate your teas, throw out maybe the first and second, and then there's considerably less of those. Um, But there's also a lot of other energy properties in tea, vitamins, nutrients, that will kind of give you that pick-me-up too, that people think of when they come about tea. Um, But what you see here are teas that are picked. Imagine we pick that tea leaf, and we wither it slightly, or we we do like a a pan fry, all right? We dry it and we pan fry it. That's essentially what we call green tea, all right? But if we take that leaf, we massage that leaf, we let it wither out in the sun, um, we maybe bake that leaf or heat it up a little bit, the enzyme that's found in every plant, whether it be you know, an avocado or tea leaf, is gonna go at work once you break that cell wall. That enzyme is polyphenol oxidase. And as that enzyme breaks down those sugars that are coming out and available to it, it changes not only the flavor of that leaf, changing it from something that's very, very green, to something that gets much, much darker. To the point that if you didn't stop that process, the tea would turn essentially into a dark tea, a hay cha, right? which you have on this end. Fully oxidized teas, let's just call those hay cha, right? 100%, no, not really. Um, and if you let that process continue even further, the tea itself begins to kind of ferment 
to the point where it's doing a little bit more than just oxidizing. It's actually kind of has its own, you know, biochemistry thing going on. There's some flora, there's some fauna, and that comes out in terms of flavor and something a little bit more earthy and a little bit more loamy. Um, so if you've ever had poor cha, or if you've ever had like a, a um, liuan, uh, hei cha, um, these are teas that have come down this path from being a green tea and gone straight down into being a dark tea. Um, and so those flavors that you'd find at a green tea, which are bright green vegetal, are no longer available. They've instead turned into something that's very, very earthy. But then what's going on in between? And that's what we're going to be dealing with today predominantly. Um, the bookends, green teas and hei cha, lu cha, hei cha, um, kind of make up this spectrum where you have no oxidation, full oxidation, and then as you start to add oxidation, you get things like white teas and huan cha, which are yellow teas. These are about you know, 0 to 10 to 20 percent oxidized, though some regional variations increase that. Um, as you kind of pull back on the full oxidation, you start getting things that are called red teas. These are what most Westerners call black teas, all right? It's what we call a hong cha in Chinese. Um, and those are very sort of ruddy in color. They're very floral. They can be very chocolatey uh, in flavor. Uh, and you've probably had them before. An English breakfast tea is essentially uh, a red tea, so long as they're not like throwing flowers or like sense. How do you stop the tea from fermenting past HR? That's a great question. So how do you stop an oxidation, let's start there, is by applying heat. And if you apply enough heat, you kill uh, a lot of that enzyme that's in there that's breaking down those sugars. Um, when you do that, you halt the darkening of the tea. All right. Uh, it's what we call a sha uh, and we'll go over that too. Um, they typically pan fry it, though sometimes they'll steam it out of a, a leaf as well. Um, that'll kill it, and that'll keep a tea that was once a green tea, pass it around, um, and retain the color. That's a green oolong. That one's from Taiwan. From uh, Ali Shan. We'll drink that first, just to confuse everybody. Um, but. As you start getting into oolong land, which is about 15% oxidized to 75% oxidized, all of these numbers are slightly variable depending on where you are. Um, they go from being quite green, like the one I'm passing around, to things that look very much like a red tea or even a black tea. So that's why we can attribute that name oolong to this, um, this black color. Now, how do you stop something from fermenting? You have to, and sometimes, thank you, um, you have to dry it out, you have to uh, cut off its access to oxygen, you have to do a lot more. Chances are, once it's started to ferment, there's very little that you can do to stop it. If anything, you can just keep it away from the things that make it want to ferment more. So, you know, imagine you have like a slice of moldy bread. Um, you know, if you want to, Play that game like what do I do how can I stop it from molding you know you can put a lot of heat on it you can dry it out you can put it out in the sun maybe the sun will kill what's ever in that but at that point you're killing bacterial strands you're killing fungus so fun right yeah. so, it's like my old apartment back in San Francisco um, <laughs> so anywho <laughs> When we're looking at oolong teas, we can break them up into some basic categories. Um, I'm being super simple right now, and we're just going to say there are three. Don't look at this one. Um, and maybe four. Um, we have on the very, very green end a tea that some people don't even call an oolong, and this is what we call a baojong. Baojong is literally a tea that's been picked, has been uh, dried a little bit, has been allowed to oxidize through slight massaging. Again, when you massage it, it breaks the cell walls. and creates that enzymatic process to start. Um, and then they uh, do a shaching, they do a wok firing, or frying they call it, um, to kill those enzymes. And it keeps it very, very green, about 8% to 12%. All right? So some people don't call this an oolong, but when you taste it, it tastes like an oolong, looks like an oolong, coming from cultivars that are oolong, so we can call it an oolong. You usually find this in Taiwan now, 
um, but it was a process that began in places like Fujian, which is right across the water in China uh, from Taiwan. Um, as you get darker and darker and darker, you have a little bit more, let's say, history, a little bit more tradition, a little bit more cultural practice that is tucked around, you know, is this actually a, a specific style that we're going for? And I'm kind of breaking it up into three, and that is we have our Anxi Guanyins, or Tia Guanyins. This is a tea that is, this is a darker version of it, if you want to pass that around. That one also is from uh, Taiwan, so I can confuse people. We have an Anxi uh, varietal, though might play with later. Um, and that's a tea that's been allowed to oxidize about 30%. And depending on the farmer, depending on the person who's roasting that tea, they might then apply an additional layers of roasts to it. Um, so that tea can be very, very green, like modern variations on this. Um, and I'll be a jerk about it when I say I don't like them because they're a little, they're kind of cutting out a lot of that process. Um, but the older versions, the more traditional versions, tend to be more structured, they tend to be more developed, like a fine wine. They're allowed to breathe out, they're allowed to um, go through a longer stage of letting the flavors develop through subsequent roasts in the initial process. Um, as a result, you get layers of flavor, where a tea will, where tea will be very, very green to begin with, but then get darker and darker, um, and that darkening, that roasting will produce you know, chocolatey flavors, apricot flavors, marigold flavors, the sky's the limit. It's a fabulous tea, but sadly is beginning to disappear because it just takes a lot of effort to make. Right? Um, in between this, so 30% and you know, further down the road, um, we have what we call Feng Huang Dan Song Wulong Cha. Um, which is Phoenix single bush oolong tea. Um, single bush because these are growing in groves that are tightly connected to one another. Um, and so if you pick a tea leaf from a plant and you pick another tea leaf from a plant that's growing right next to it, there's a good chance that tea plant is gonna taste very similar to the one that's right next to it. And so you can isolate cultivars and you can isolate varietals and you can bring out very, very specific flavors from them uh, if you do that. And that's how you get this very specific style of tea. Um, and this is somewhere between 30 to 70 percent oxidized. Um, they're both very lightly oxidized sometimes, can be very, very green, or they can be very, very dark. I've had these where they're so dark that they're almost a red tea, and they'd actually call it a hong cha. But the varietal that they're using, the plant base that they're using, is an oolong. And then finally, and more historically, let's say this is almost like a timeline going backwards, um, we have teas that are growing in the Wuyi Mountains, which are in Fujian, it's a UNESCO heritage site. Um, and these teas are darker, they tend to get a higher roast, uh, they tend to have longer bouts of oxidation, um, upwards to 10 hours, sometimes more. Um, of massaging the leaves, letting them sit, massaging the leaves, letting them sit 10 hours or more. Um, and then uh, they do subsequent very, very low heat roasts to these to produce a tea that's quite amazing. Um, but because of that long period of rolling the tea and then letting it sit, it oxidizes upwards to about 75%. So these are the darker of the oolongs. So any questions? Um, so when you say massage the leaves, yeah. what's the process look like? Like, mm -hmm. is it actually like hands over? A... Yeah, yeah. Um, I was gonna make a stupid joke, but um, <laughs> um, it's like a massaging. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so they pick the leaves. They here. Next slide. This is great. Um, so instead of moving this way now, we're gonna move this way. Um, you pick the leaves. You pick them off of the tea plant, right? And you're picking very specific leaves depending on what type of tea. It's either the upper buds, or it might be the first four leaves, depends. Um, might be a little side leaf. Um, you pick that leaf, and then you go into what's called xia qing, um, which means, literally means sun burning the tea. But you're, you're letting them wither in the sun, all right? And that enables the 
moisture that's initially latent in the tea to kind of leave um, without doing any massaging. So green teas will get things like this, um, depending on how delicate or indelicate they are. Um, all teas kind of go through this. Um, then you have a cooling phase where they take that out of the sun and they're like, okay, we're gonna take you to a nice cooler place. Um, they usually put those on, we'll see pictures of it, uh, a little bamboo or sort of rattan or grass uh, baskets, very, very wide baskets, about this big. And they'll just leave those out, usually in like tall vertical racks, or sometimes if they're a little bit more old school, they'll just kind of spread it around in like a warehouse or under a canopy. Um, and that allows whatever heat was still in there to dissipate. And that can be either the sort of heat of something beginning to slightly kind of ferment, um, or it's the heat of the sun. So once you cool it down, at that point, you toss the leaves. This is all for oolong. You toss the leaves, and that's just literally picking up the leaves and doing this. And everybody has their own style. So every farm is going to go like, no, you don't do it that way. You do like this. Or you take the, the actual basket and go like this. You know, or you do this. Or as you're picking it up, you go like this. Or as you're, you know, doing that, you bring it down, and then you press it onto the basket. Every farm is going to be slightly different. Um, and that's because back in the day, there's a good chance that you might know how to make your tea, but you might not actually go across the valley to learn how somebody else is going to know how, you know, to make their tea. So a lot of regional and really micro-regional differences emerge in tea, and that's why we have thousands of different types of tea in China alone. Uh, oolongs especially are some of the most diverse. Um, so they're tossing them, the tossing action bruises them. Um, if you're a real purist about this, the bruising already occurred because as you're picking the leaves, you're slightly bruising it. You know, you're like, ouch, you know, pinching it off. Um, and then also you're gonna go, ouch, and then you're gonna throw it in your little basket that's either right, you know, behind your back or is somewhere right here, usually it's in the back. Um, and then you're gonna, you know, go downhill. And all that's gonna slightly change it. So when we talk about is a tea purely unoxidized? No, it's very hard to get a pure unoxidized tea. All teas kind of already go through some level of oxidation. I hate to say it. Um, green teas, less so because they're not going through this more tossily kind of, you know, uh, let's kind of disturb the tea. Um, at that point, after they've done massaging, and depending on the tea, depending on the style of tea that they want, it'll be different. Again, Wei Yan Cha sometimes receives upwards to about 10 hours of, you know, this, the Yao Qing, and then sometimes the uh, this rolling and shaking. Um, after that, they do withering, which is again kind of laying it out, all right? Um, and that's allowing the uh, oxidation to occur. So however long this is dictates, again, how long the tea, or how much the tea will oxidize, and how dark the tea will be, and how more, let's say, robust the flavor of the tea will be. Finally, sort of finally, um, <laughs> we get to what's called the Sha Qing. If this was a green tea, they'd pick it, they'd wither it, they might cool it, and then they Sha Qing it. They don't really do this. They might toss it, maybe a little bit. But in Oolong, because you have all of these steps in between, and then you get to the Sha Qing, all of a sudden, what you're killing, this, this polyphenol oxidase, has already done its job to the tea, to the leaves. They've already darkened it at some point. Um, and this is just a process to heat the tea very, very quickly to a very high heat, and then pull it off the heat, and then cool it again, and then do a series of rolling and shaping, whether it's into this pellet form or into this sort of twisted dragon form. And then finally, depending on the style of the tea, it'll go through baking and drying and roasting. And this will done, be done oftentimes over ash pits, um, but not always. It really depends on the tea. And it's usually done in, you have an ash pit, and then you have a big basket, and that basket sits on that ash pit and sort of indirectly really, really heats up that tea, but it's a slow process. You don't want to do this with really, really high heat over a quick period of time, you want to do it with a controlled heat over long periods of time. 
and depending on the tea, you'll put it down on that and then you'll bring it out and you'll let it cool down and then you'll put it back down onto an ash pit. It sometimes can take, you know, a day or two. Um, and some teas, they'll re-roast after they've been produced. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. When you're like molding and shaping, mm -hmm. is there a lot of like, I don't know, like tea loss to just like, does it just like crumble basically? Mm -hmm. So I mean like, I'm talking about like Lipton, you know, it's like mm -hmm. very fine or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I mean, is there a lot of like tea loss when they're doing that process? So it's a great question and it's a great, great moment to rip on Lipton. Yeah, um, I agree. <laughs> so when we have, tea process, there's a step that I kind of omitted here, and that is the sorting. So we've got, let's say we picked like, you know, two kilos of tea, right? And out of that two kilos, we'll probably, when it comes to sorting, we might only keep, you know, maybe a tenth of that to make good tea. All right, I'm just giving a general number. Of that tenth, there might be some that's excellent, we'll want to you know, be really careful with that. Of uh, the rest of that tenth, it'll be standard, um, and it will fit like, oh, it kind of seems like it's the right type of tea. Um, of the rest of that, um, some of that's gonna be tea that's meant for blending. Um, some of that's gonna be tea that is just like, oh, I'll just keep it around the house and I'll drink it, or we'll, you know, kind of distribute it to the folks who are not really intensely in the tea market. Um, or we might give it to somebody else and they'll finish it or do something with it or repackage it, kind of white label it. Um, and then you have um, kind of in English terms, we use the term fannings. This is the dust. This is the dust, the byproduct. And the reason why they're called fannings is that back in the day, you would have somebody fanning the table to blow this dust off the table onto the ground. They would sweep it up and then that would be what goes into your tea bag. So, you know, but then, um, so, um, you know, different grading and that sort of, you know, ratio that I gave isn't the case all across the board. If you're really careful, if you're a really careful tea farmer, um, you'll handle your tea very delicately. You'll know what to do with it. And by delicately, I mean, you know, at least smart. Um, whereas when you get into big factory farms, you know, it's, it's kind of like how we treat our factory animals. You know, it's like, they, it's just like, it's a product, you know, um, we're not going to be nice to them. Um, do we care how it tastes? Well, we have this general idea of how it's supposed to taste, you know, but a lot of tea connoisseurs will not even drink that stuff, so. I have a question about the, <clears throat> about the last slide. Yes. Are all Phoenix oolongs yes. um, single bush? No. Um, I mean, they're, they're, <coughs> they're dancing. Um, which is a style. Um, Danzong can also refer to um, a grading system. So I, I've, I've gotten in trouble for saying everything's a Danzong because that can just refer to the highest quality of something. It's um, like you can use it in place of premium or yeah, something. Yeah. Um, but when you go to what I've seen when I've gone to farms in Chaozhou, which is where they're coming from, which is right here, Chaozhou, this is Guangdong province, um, Fenghuangdan, uh, um, when you go there, um, you'll see big farms that will say, oh, it's Dan's home, but it's not because it's just a big, you know, uh, what do we call it? What do we call those things? Um, plantation. Um, but then when you get to some of the real cool farms, they're like itty bitty, like the size of this room. And it's like, this is all that we make, you know? And you see that a lot too. So those are what are bad home. Um, and again, is it coming from one plant, one bush? Yes and no, there might be a mother plant that it's coming from. So if you, if you have a tree, all right? You either have a tree and it will grow and it'll look like one tree, or if it grows and it starts to spread out, it might look like multiple trees, but it's all the same tree. Or that tree will drop seeds and all of a sudden those trees will grow up right next to it and genetically they're very similar. Um, or because you have a microclimate in that specific area and you have sort of a micro terroir, you'll have a similar flavor. So that's what's gonna make a tea that comes from one side of a mountain taste very different from the tea that comes from the other side of the mountain. And I've done tea tastings like that, where it's like, this is the same tea, 
same tea plant, you know, it's the same cultivar, um, but all of a sudden, it tastes very different um, because of, you know, water source, because of the minerality in the ground, because of the soil content, because of the way that they're doing all these things. Um, and then there's the question about clones, like you're gonna graft a plant onto another one, and it's gonna produce a flavor too, so. Um, but Dan Song, yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a demarcator of quality. That kind of goes back to your question too, from the very beginning. So, um, I don't wanna skip this slide, because it kind of gives us the geography of tea. Um, locating Wulong tea, um, this is just showing Wulong tea. If you, I've made maps of China where it shows, you know, 20, 30, 50 different teas, and that's really just scratching the surface. Again, there are thousands of teas. Um, this is showing the famous places. So we have, historically speaking, starting in the north, teas were being grown here during the Tang and during the Song period. So from the 700s, to the 1200s, tea was being grown there. Um, what was being grown there is a good question. Uh, we'll delve a little bit into that, but today, if you go there, you're gonna find teas being grown in Wishan and Fujian, and famously, you'll find what's called the Sidaoming Song, uh, and this is the same song as you would find in Feng Huang Dan Song. It's, it's a bush uh, or a grove. Um, and some of those we might know very well, like Da Hong Pao, Big Red Robe. We're going to taste that tonight, I promise. Um, but other ones are a little bit harder to find, and quite honestly, they're beginning to become less popular and harder to, you know, convince people to make. Um, like Shui Ji Wei, that is probably my second favorite tea coming out of China right now. And nobody wants to make it. It makes me sad. Um, Xiao Wu Huan, which is, Shui Ji Wei, by the way, means, um, sort of golden or aquamarine shining uh, uh, sea turtle, all right, or water turtle. Uh, Shui Jin is you know, water gold way turtle. Um, Tia Lo Han is iron arhat uh, or uh, Lohan. And a Lohan is a disciple of the Buddha who received enlightenment. Um, it's made of iron. There's a reason why they say iron, because it's the color of the tea is very irony. And then Bai Zi Guan, which is white, a uh, cock's comb, and it kind of looks like a cock's comb, if you've ever seen a chicken with this like, little headdress. Um, and then further south in Fujian, you have Anxi province, um, and in that you have teas like Tie Guan Yin being made, you have teas um, that uh, are typically greener, um, and you have a little bit of cross-fertilization going on, so sometimes the teas from this will historically kind of make their way down there and then they'll start doing other things with those tea leaves. And what's cool about that is historically they, they, there's a lot of interconnectivity and also a lot of you know, isolation. So some things get adopted, other things get discarded or are not even talked about. And we'll talk about why that happens. And then finally, further in the south, you have uh, uh, your Feng Huan Shan, your uh, Phoenix Mountain in Chaozhou, um, and these are some fantastic teas, we'll taste one. And then by the 1800s, you have Taiwan. Um, there was tea growing before that, but the famous ones began to start growing around that time. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. So the Silk Road, I mean, mm -hmm. like obviously Silk went down Silk Road, but also like porcelain, we did tea mm -hmm. then as Big well. time, big yeah. time. Um, that's another story altogether. And I could spend another, you know, lifetime talking about that. But Silk Road, you'll find, goes out here, all right? It's more to the west. Um, you have what's called the Chama Hu Dao, which is the ancient tea horse road. And that kind of starts right around here in uh, uh, Yunnan and Sichuan. Um, porcelain Road, I don't know if there's actually a porcelain road per se, but a lot of the kilns are on the, on the west coast, or I mean the east coast of China. And you have that moving inward, you have that moving upward to Beijing, you have that moving to the south, to Southeast Asia. But then you also have people like the Dutch, and you also have people like the English, and you also have, you know, people like the Japanese, and, and the Portuguese, and even, you know, people coming from here. And they're all wanting that. Um, and funny thing is that when the Dutch got there in the 1500s and 1600s, following the Portuguese, they got really into tea. And they're like, oh my gosh, can't wait to bring some of this back. And so they bring it. 
but T is pretty light, right? This is leaves. So to ballast their ships, and ballast is something that you need in a ship, otherwise the ship goes out to the ocean and then goes like that, because it's not bottom heavy. So to ballast, to put something heavy in the bottom of that ship, to make it not do which happened a lot, they would put porcelain in there. So it fed two crazes that hit Europe like, I don't know, what do we like now? Chocolate. Chocolates? <laughs> iPhones, yeah, it's like, uh, hey, the new iPhone. iPhone. No, no, <laughs> it's funny though, because chocolate and coffee and tea all kind of became popular at the same time. Beverage culture exploded. And what's interesting about these beverages, they're not alcoholic, all right? Prior to tea coming to the European mainland, people were, even babies, you know, little kids, were drinking beer and wine because they didn't know that if you just boil water, you're killing everything that's going to kill you by boiling that water. You drink tea, all of a sudden, oh, you're not dying as quickly. It's an elixir of life, you know? Um, so, um, going way back, and this is not even going as far back as we could, um, during the Tong, so, you know, 600s to 800s, um, at least that period for tea, um, tea was beginning to get a little bit more fancy. Prior to that, it was a medicine. Prior to that, it was like a folk thing that you would put in a pot, you boil a pot, and voila, you have something. You'd probably throw salt, you'd put, uh, you know, ginseng in there, you'd put onions, you'd put a lot of different things. So it was kind of a soup with tea as part of it. Um, by the Song, though, they began to, Song period, 960 to 1279, um, they began to do away with everything other that, that wasn't tea. So you would have just tea, finally. People were just drinking tea for tea's sake. And back then, they would take the tea leaves, they'd pick them, they'd go through a very specific process, which I recreate in one of these videos that I do, and you can watch it and taste it at some point. Um, and they'd press it into a cake. And then they'd take that cake and they'd grind that cake up into a fine powder, similar to like what we'd see in matcha, all right? At the time of the Song, um, in places like Wishan, and even places like, and I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this, places like uh, Feng Huanzan, they were producing cakes that were marked or stamped with a dragon and a phoenix. And so when we talk about maybe an origin for Wulong, some people ascribe that the reason why we call it Oolong is because we have this dragon on it. And why we might call it a phoenix tea, like a phoenix Oolong? Well, maybe because there's a phoenix on that. Kind of hard to see in this. But they would press it in the cake, they'd grind it up. There's a guy grinding it right there. And then they'd whip it like you would almost like whip a bowl of matcha. It's a little different. And you drink it here, you know, dudes hanging out, drinking tea. This is what's called a dou cha, which means uh, a tea battle or a tea competition. You're trying to say, oh, I can make tea better than you. You know, let's drink. Um, and that's what they would get. You'd get this bowl of tea. This is a three times the size that it should be, but um, bowl of tea. And it's this beautiful white. We think it would be white. They talk about it being white. They say it's like white like jade or white like snow. Um, very foamy uh, beverage. And um, I've made this tea, I, I've hand ground the tea down to the point where it can suspend in water and turn into this foamy thing. Um, takes a couple of hours, but it's, it's like out of the game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're just going back to basics. They're just going back to basics. When they start making song period white tea, I'll be like, okay, I was wrong this whole time. <laughs> so I'm sorry for what I said. <laughs> Other teas that you'd find in China around this time and upwards to the Ming, and you'll still find, are things like these basket teas. This is what's called a Yuan Hei Cha. I mentioned this earlier. Um, it's, it's tea that's fermenting in a basket, all right? It's kind of like a black tea or a Hei Cha. Um, tastes like licorice. Uh, in Korea, you have what's called Tuan Cha, and this specifically is a Tuan Cha, but what we call Dok Cha. This is tea that's been pounded and compressed. The reason why we call it Dok Cha is because in Korea, they have this thing called Dok. Dok is like mochi. You pound it in this mortar and pestle kind of thing, and it just turns into a mush. And then they compress it into these little twan, or these little uh, coin-shaped things, and they string them along on these strings. They were doing this in China, too, in the Tang and in the Song. 
um, and you still see this going on in Korea. Is it like an Insta, like Instapot? You just drop it in and you're like, oh, cool. Sort of, but you gotta boil it. Okay. So it takes a long time. These are so compressed that they're hard to actually brew. Okay. What I've been doing is recreating Tong period tea with this because they made stuff like this during the Tong. You would roast it over an open flame and then you pulverize it and then you throw that into a boiling pot of water. And it's really interesting. It's really intense. But during the meeting, they were still producing things like this. So how did we get to loose leaf teas? Well, we have this guy to thank. Um, this is uh, Emperor Hong Yu, Hong Yu, sorry. Um, and in 1391, 1392, he said, well, we're not gonna do these cake tea things anymore because it's too costly and you guys are so corrupt that you're like trying to throw off, you know, regional economies by screwing around with tea, um, you're also hoarding tea, and also it's just really elitist. So let's do away with this. That's some reason, there's probably a lot more for that. But um, people were drinking teas like this, but it wasn't popular within the court. So basically I think what he was saying is like, well, other people are doing it this way, so let's come on. Um, it's kind of a sumptuary law, if you know what that means. Um, and what emerged early on was Green teas like we know them, um, black teas like we know them, poor kind of like we know them, H kind of like we know them. Um, but then eventually during the late Ming period, uh, in the sort of 16th century, um, we have the emergence of what's long. And that came in a place called Songlo, um, which began to experiment with wok firing teas. Um, this is an Anhui province, which is a little bit north, a little bit west. Um, but eventually, the real sort of standardized process of making oolong makes its way to a place called Fujian, specifically uh, uh, Wuyishan. And this is where we have what is now recognized as an oolong tea. Um, this is where they allow oxidation to occur. And from that, you have the emergence of the, the famous teas uh, during this time um, that extends into the chain. Um, you have the emergence of the use of little teapots, which is what makes me happy. Um, these are done by very, very famous uh, potters from that period. Um, a lot of them are still being held in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. in the Freer Sackler collection. Right. Question about Yixing. Yeah. So if you use a Yixing pot mm -hmm. and it's super old, mm -hmm. do you have to keep like wetting it down with a little crack to the thing? Um, you probably saw that episode of Sherlock or something like that. Um, you know, You're so right. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so maybe, maybe um, the reason why I would say wet the thing and always pre wet your teaware is because things do get brittle. Yeah. Um, I've used tea bowls that are like twelve hundred years old, and they're very brittle. So what do I do? I kind of introduce them to water. Um, first by either submerging them in water or wetting the surface and then hitting them with a little bit of warm water, a little bit of warmer water and just kind of build up. The last thing I'd want is, you know, a national treasure to break. Yeah. But, yeah. Does <laughs> uh, it make the tea taste uh, different when you use the older pot? It depends because, like, yes and no. The clay, the, the clay quality back then was probably much better than what we're getting today. Yes and no. Um, the artistry is fantastic, as you can see. Um, and if they're using quality leaves for brewing and they didn't like let it sit in the pot too long or it like molds, there's a good chance you can still use it. Oh. So like I have friends who use teapots that are 150 to 300 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I had a buddy of mine, and we'll see a picture of it, use a teapot that was claimed to be owned by one of the emperors of China during the Qing period, so 1600s, 1700s. He was still using it. So, you know, and it made fantastic tea. Um, I have, again, tea bowls that are 1200, 1400 years old. Um, still works, so. Uh, these are some dudes hanging out drinking some tea. Um, if you want to know more, just read this. Um, uh, but this is done during the main period. It's showing the popularization of using teapots. Are they drinking oolong tea? I don't know. But oolong tea was around at that time. They may have been drinking some poor, they may have been drinking some green tea. They didn't really, I mean, there were people advocating for loose leaf tea, and I should have included a slide talking about the dude who really advocated that, but it's 
you'll be fine with this. But as, what you'll see is, is these guys are drinking the tea, but the guy who's actually making the tea is this kid in the back. All right, what we call a chop home. And he's fanning the brazier, he's doing this. He's got a little brazier right here, fanning it. That's so the water can boil. And then he's gonna pour the water into the teapot, which in this case is huge. Um, so when we talk about the skill of making tea, a lot of it's concentrated here, less here, you know. Um, and we can make similar parallels today where we have the young overworked over here doing all the work and then we have some rich dudes hanging out there going like, oh, isn't my friend. New York. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, so Oolong continues to constantly evolve um, during the Qing. Um, we start getting things like uh, Yin, which we pass around. Um, we start getting things like other types of uh, Wuyishan, Yancha, these cliff teas from Wuyishan. Um, we also get uh, the emergence of more types of Phoenix Oolongs. Um, but then we also start getting towards the late Qing period, the emergence of things like Baozhong. Um, so they're, they're getting more refined in their processing and they're getting more experimental. Um, and so too does this teaware. This is the teapot that was owned by uh, Qianlong, um, reportedly. Um, this is a tea cup that's in the shape of a peach. Um, these are all made of yixingware, by the way. Um, you get beautiful teapots like this that are shaped like, you know, wrapped up gifts. Um, you get beautiful doltai cups that, uh, you know, have wonderful dragons emblazed on them. But you also get really just down to earth people wear, like stuff like this. Even though this is Korean, this is like the stuff that you'd find all around China. You know, very, very basic stuff to facilitate the need of, hey, I just want some tea. Um, and that's what we'll see here too. This is what we call a Chaozhou Gongfu Cha tea set. It's the full kit. We have the Sha Jiao, um, which is this wonderful clay kettle. We have our Roshan uh, tea cups, which are the three little cups. They like to use three cups in Chaozhou. We have our Chaoyang clay stove, um, and we call those Milu. They still use these in, in Chaozhou. And then finally, we have our, our Yixing purple sand, uh, Zisha Cha Hu, uh, and it's sitting in what's called a Cha Chuan, which is a beautiful little bowl, just like this. Um, it means tea boat. It's just floating in a tea boat. What cup you showed earlier, was mm. that from Jinlong? Uh, Kangxi period. Oh, which one? Yeah. This one. Ooh, good question. Um, they don't have a they don't have a definite thing on there, but I'm pretty sure it's probably it's originated from that period. There are is lots of right? copies. No, it is not. Uh, it's it's high fired, or at least high fired to the degree that you'd find. You know, I don't know our cone numbers. My friends would know this, but it's you see how shiny this is. It's indicative of it being a higher fire when it's a little bit duller, similar to this doesn't really shine as well. Um, lower fire. Um, also, these look really well well used and well loved. The shininess comes from tea oil. This one especially is like super shiny inside. That's resin that's uh, accumulating there. Uh, same here. So this is where the whole practice of what we call Gong Fu Cha really emerges, and that's in the late Qing period. People say Gong Fu existed since the Song, maybe the Tong. I believe that to be the case. When we take the term Gong Fu, it just means skill acquired by being challenged. There's a whole series that I do on that. Um, but the approach that we now know today is Gong Fu Cha, where you take either a uh, Gaiwan, or you use a teapot like this, um, that really was popularized and sort of canonized, or canonized um, during this period. Prior to that, again, we had dudes hanging out with big teapots. Right. So. Why is it three? Three cups? Yeah, is that like a thing? Three is a very strong number in Chinese numerology. Um, three is, you know, heaven, earth, and the people who live betwixt them. It's also, you know, let's look at this teapot for a good example. Three is also indicative of a tripod. It's something that if you push it, it's not gonna tip over so easily. You can tip over a chair if it has four legs, but if it has three, it's solid. Um, it also means that's gonna hold up the universe. It's what we call a ding, or dinghu, um, a vessel with three, three legs. So three is common. 
Um, Buddhism too, you see threes for like the triple treasures. Um, and, and Taoism, you see three come up a lot too. Um, it's a lucky number. But also, how many cups does this teapot hold? Three. So, yeah, as many as it can make, but <laughs> if you empty this, it's gonna empty out really nicely into these three cups. Um, it's gonna overflow if it's two. If it's four, it's gonna be like, you're kind of folding back, aren't you? So it, it also kind of plays to, well, this is kind of an ideal shape and size, well, three cups. So, um, as we get into the late Qing and Republican period too, tea becomes wildly popular worldwide, not just in China. Um, you have tea shops that you'll find in every city during this time. That's kind of what they look like, at least in southern China. Um, you can actually, if this was a higher res image, you could actually zoom in and see what type of tea is on each one of these little boxes here. Um, here it says uh, famous teas, uh, something, something. Famous teas, famous teas, I think it's a tea Chinese. Um, and then uh, we also have it being exported, uh, or at least you know garnering a lot of foreign interest. Um, this is a very interesting little box, uh, white lilac, extra choicest Formosa oolong. Um, Formosa is the old word for Taiwan, um, and this was produced during Japanese occupation of Taiwan. Um, during that time period, you have an oolong boom going on in Taiwan, and that is because it's not only being consumed by folks in Taiwan and folks in China, but it's also being consumed largely by folks in Japan and then also folks in the United States. So it becomes internationally known. Um, so that's a long story. I did a graduate thesis on that, and uh, you can find that somewhere. Um, Oolong tea today. Um, this is kind of it at its most Paired down. Um, these are those bamboo baskets that I was talking about where they're cooling the tea or you know they're in between roasting or they're in the process of being processed. Um, if you zoom in right here this is a mechanized version of a roller. So with some oolongs they take them and they put them in this big sort of canvas bag or this big cloth that they wrap up into this kind of like beach ball shape kind of thing. And they roll that around. That helps to facilitate that massaging that we talked about. At the end of the day, it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller as more liquid moves out of it um, to the point where it's about the size of a small soccer ball. So something that starts this big gets down to about that big. And they put it into this drum and then it goes like um, that is literally just to recreate what people would be doing. So when people say machine process, you know, it really depends on what the machine is doing. Is it just facilitating something that's done by hand, or is it like chopping the tea? Is it like abusing the tea? Depends. So, and this was a farm that, or a processing station that I visited um, several years back in uh, Chaozhou on Wudanshan. Um, on the top of Wudanshan, you see this magnificent tree. This is the Songdong tree. I think somebody told me it died, which makes me very sad because this tree has been around since the Song period. Um, it's about 800 to 1100 years old. And every year they would have a lottery that would say, hey, only one tea company gets to pick the tea from this, nobody else. And these things get abused as they tend to be. So that tea might be abused, might be dead. Um, but this tree is about the size of an oak tree. So it's about 30 feet tall, it's big. Um, and it's surrounded by bushes, you know, it's kind of a danzong kind of thing, you know, single bush. That's one big tree and all these little baby bushes around it. Each one of these is about 100 to 300 years old. Also making that tea. Do so, they collect leaves from <clears> the tree too? They do. So they should use like a ladder. What's that? They use a ladder to go. They use a ladder, and if you see the structure around it during the well, sort of, yeah. The so so you you can climb up these structures, um, and what they'll do during the brighter season. So this we can went on kind of a very classic, uh, you know, kind of gray day, um, but if there's a lot of sun that day, they'll put um, canvas over this to protect the plant. So. If the, naturally the sunlight hit too much on the tree, it might mm -hmm. change the flavor. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
too much sun and the tea becomes a little bit too more, like too much robust. Uh, too robust. Language skills are bad. Um, uh, it's kind of like Japanese gyokuro. If you've ever had Japanese gyokuro um, or kabuseka, um, they put a awning over it, and that produces uh, it, it produces the effect of reducing the amount of sunlight. And as a result, the plants respond by sending more chlorophyll to the tree. Or to what the do plant. they do? They send more chlorophyll into the leaves. The plant does. What do this. Like, people do with the plants when they? When they're covered? Yeah, they, they cover. Huh? What do they use to cover it? Usually, so in in Japan, they usually use, um, nowadays they use, you know, like tarpaulins, or they use like this kind of perforated uh, mesh. Um, that's probably what they're using here. I'm like thinking they're probably using the cheapest thing available to them because it's kind of big. Um, is it fabric or plastic? I, my guess is now it's probably more plastic than fabric, but back in the day they would use canvas. Um, or they would use reed, mm -hmm. which would be put together. Or they would use hemp. You know, hemp is everywhere in China. Hemp. Um, as far as the producers, you were saying yeah. they would pick from that tea. Are oh. most of the producers like single producers, or do they have like uh, I guess um, like groups that mm -hmm. work together? Or so what's all like of that. Landscape? All of that. So I've, I've worked with farmers and I know farmers who are single on their own. It's just a family. But they usually belong to a group who, you know, let's say you run into a bad time and like the weather kind of kicked your butt that year or the market was down. You name it. They kind of collectivize. And this is part of, you know, communist China collectivizing. But also historically you had collectivization on a certain level too. Um, and they would come together and they would pool their tea sometimes, or they wouldn't, and they'd just make their own. Or sometimes they'd say like, okay, we're gonna pull it together and make this tea. Um, I don't know if the term donghui is used in places like Chaozhou, but when I was in Yunnan, there's a term called donghui, which refers to a collective group. Um, and it's a co-op. Co yeah, okay. yeah, it's like a co-op, and, and you, are part of it, and tea you pick, some of it you send into a sort of collective bunch, and they produce tea, but you can also produce your own tea. So, so with that though, there's not like a, a negotiate, for example, like that, that buys all the teas and mm -hmm. then makes it into one, it's more so like everyone still has a say in how it happens? They're, they're well, yes and no, because um, you do have quality control, there's the QS of okay. Chinese tea, which happened I think in 2004, 2002, I'll try to get back to that, maybe 2008. Um, and that was in response to people just trying to sell a lot of crappy tea, honestly. Um, it was during a poor boom, um, and they're like, well, we need this now because, you know, there's some bad tea now on the market, um, and a lot of it. Um, but then there's also, there's more um, autonomy, I'd say, than less autonomy. People can generally do what they want to do. Um, though if you talk to a tea farmer, they're constantly complaining. So, yeah. um, but they're, they're pretty independent people when I've run into them. But you have also tea farmers that are just large conglomerates. You know? So it's the whole gamut. Um, I don't deal with that. I deal with smaller, uh, you know, smaller farms when I do. Uh, so it's been awful. So. Um, Gonna kind of briefly throw into this, um, just understanding gong fu. Um, we're gonna go through all of these teas and we'll go over this more in detail, but essentially it's pair your pot to your tea. All right, so pick a tea, any tea. In this case, we're gonna pick this beautiful Taiwanese oolong. We'll drink that first, fine. Um, pick your teapot, which one would be that? The shape, the size, the materiality, the clay of the teapot, the firing, the shape of the mouth of the teapot. The, you know, even the handle and the spout, um, where this little, you know, nub sits. All of that's going to affect how it feels in the hand, all of that's going to affect how it brews the tea. Um, so, we can go in detail on this, maybe not right now, but uh, I want to drink some tea. Um, we'll put some tea into the teapot, alright? So this is the, what we call, poetically, the oolong oolong, which is the black dragon oolong, right? 
Wu Gong means entering the palace. All right. So the black dragon enters the palace. Poetic. Um, here we have it sitting in the teapot, and then we pour water over the tea in such a way that it doesn't spill and that it keeps all of the tea moist and ready to brew. Uh, you can go crazy like Crazy Scott did one day and take all of your tea leaves, grade them by shape and size, and then lay them specifically in with a chopstick into the teapot. People used to do this. Um, and maximize the potential of the tea flavor. Why do you do this? Well, if you have the idea of, oh, of really wanting to do the best with what you're given, you might want to do this, but you also have to have like four hours free time. <laughs> so, um, brewing and pouring water. I typically brew and pour water in the spiral fashion, in this case, a clockwise fashion. You'll see me do this. So, this is for folks at home too. Um, and then you pour water over the teapot, and I'll explain why you do that. You'll look at the tea spout. Look at the tea spout. And that'll tell you that the tea is ready. Um, we'll do this not with this first tea. We'll brew the first tea in a gaiwan. I'm sorry, that's really anticlimactic. But, um, but we'll see this in the second tea that we brew. Um, and then finally, we'll look at the tea once it's brewed. Did you overbrew it? How do you know? Well, it might be in the cup of tea. So what are you looking for? In this case, we're, we just brewed a Li Shan Gao Shan Wu Long Cha. Um, this is a high mountain Taiwanese oolong from Li Shan, Para Mountain. Um, super green, super bright, very light, very floral. Um, in this case, we brewed some anchi tea of one yin. Um, we'll brew that tonight and we'll look for this color. Uh, and then finally, you can't really see it on this because it kind of darkens out, but this is piao hong pao, and it looks like wine. It looks like a nice Bordeaux, um, as it should, because it's really dark, really rich, really red. Um, and then finally, as we assess the flavor, don't just assess as you're drinking, assess the lingering flavor. What in Chinese we call hui yan, this sort of returning sweetness. And that's going to tell you a lot more about the quality of tea than just the leaves, just the liqueur, just the smell, everything. It's what's it's gonna leave on your palate. So if you came in here having a cup of coffee and we drink this next tea, I assure you, you will no longer taste your cup of coffee because the quality of this tea is so high that whatever flavor was already on your palate is now dissipated and it's been re removed and replaced by something beautiful, something that lasts a long time. That flavor will sometimes last for hours. So that's what we call play again. Um, I think that's pretty much it. You can, you know, again, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you can slow me down at this point, listen to my slow voice, and then uh, read this all. But um, we're going to go and we're going to start finally drinking some tea. So, how are we looking on this goofy thing? All right. Joanne says hello. Hi, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're turning this off. Technology down. I don't know if this is going to explode by the TV, but find that out. So... We came here to drink some tea. I have no idea what time it is. I'll probably lose all aspect of time very soon. 8.16. We can drink this tea as fast as we want or as slow as we want. So I leave that up to everybody who's sitting here and is trying to define that for themselves. I'm going to drink this at the pace that the tea wants to be consumed. Um, so. Any questions before we jump into the wine world of Wulong? You steep the tea in the actual pot. Yes. How do you stop it from oversteeping? You just pour all the water out at once? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so that's like you're stopping the catalyst. Yes. Right. And I like that you use catalyst. That's very proper. Um, so first tea we're going to brew is this delicious Taiwanese Wulong. Can you see it? All right. Um, this is coming from Alishan. Alishan is in kind of central Taiwan. Uh, it's one of the higher mountains, 13 to 1300 to 1800 meters above sea level. That's pretty high. Uh, a lot of Chinese teas don't get that high. Um, and Taiwan's an island. And it has rich soil. And all that's going to end up affecting 
what we taste and how we taste it. Um, as we're brewing with a gaiwan, gaiwan are wonderful little vessels. I rarely use them because I'm a big teapot person. Um, I'm a big little teapot person, I should say. Um, but gaiwan are cool. They've been around since the Ming period, so 1300s to 1600s. And they come from what used to be the tea bowl, the cha wan, all right? So gai wan just means lidded wan. So you have your gai, gai zi, and then you have your wan, which is this bowl. And then you have this little guy, which is, it's not a guy, I should say. Um, this is a little thing that sits in your hand, so you're not burning your hand. And if you remember that picture of the Song period tea bowl, it was sitting on that red lacquer thing, it's kind of where this comes from. All right, so again, going back to the number three in Chinese numerology, you have your earth, you have your heaven, and then you have all the action in between it. And action in this case is gonna be where we're gonna be brewing some tasty tea. So, warming my vessel, pouring it out. And then, measuring my tea, which in this case, who knows? Um, oh, um, and then we pour that in there. That's kind of like the oolong gong in this case. Um, this is a little bit more of an open palace. Uh, and we'll brew that tea. And as we brew that tea, maybe I should actually let you smell it. I don't normally rinse my teas, but when I do, and I'm rinsing this to kind of let it evenly wet versus it's dirty and it needs to be rinsed. It's not, it just sometimes if you wet the tea before you brew the tea, it brews better. I'm gonna pass this around and put this here so you're not gonna scald yourself. Smell the tea, get a sense of what flavors exist in that little cup. Buttery, buttery. For those in the wine world, are there names or attributions <laughs> that we might come? conversation the other day. <laughs> I can't like distinguish tastes in wine when I can't eat. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's your point. <laughs> I can't wine. <laughs> that tastes the same thing. Don't change. <laughs> when I hear buttery, I think of like a, a California uh, Chardonnay. Chardonnay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's that sort of buttery in this case. We might get some Riesling notes. Some like aged Riesling. Nutty. Nutty. Yeah. Nice. Verdant. Verdant, yes. I like this. Nice. And what do you think of the leaves? Now that they've kind of met the water. They're opening they, up. They're opening up. They're getting yeah. a little bit more friendly. They're getting a little bit more friendly to the <laughs> idea that I'm going to pour some scalding water on them. So. Is there a reason that they make pearls sometimes? Like, instead mm. of, I mean, obviously, like, rolling it into, like, yeah. the dragon, as you said. Yeah. So, in this case, this tea was rolled. Again, I'm going to show the world. Hi. Um, they roll these because, one, it, from sort of a, a storage standpoint, all of a sudden, what would normally fit a caddy this big is fitting in a caddy this big. All right, so it, it facilitates that very nicely. Also, less breakage. less breakage, certainly. You know, you, I can kind of abuse these leaves a little bit more. I can throw them in a, in a caddy and, you know, not have to be so delicate with them. Um, but at the same time, they will also age a little bit better um, when they're rolled like that because less surface area is being exposed. Um, and at the same time, it also slows down the brewing process. And as you slow down the brewing process, you can get a little bit more developed in flavor. I can let this sit for a long time and it will still give flavor because it's still opening up. A good sort of parallel to this in the tea world is if you've ever brewed a pour. Pour teas come as loose leaf, but they also come in cakes. And cakes are compressed and if they're really compressed, it takes a long time for them to open. So it takes a longer time for all of that flavor to leave. 
So if you want to sit and drink a lot of tea, an oolong that's been rolled up like that is kind of a nice choice because it's going to take a little bit longer for it to literally open up. Um, I like to push my teas, so forgive me if this is going to be like a, a big snack of tea, um, but this is a style that I've learned. Um, as you can see, the leaves are beginning to open up quite a bit. This teacup is very, very hot. So, it's also why they flare out like that, so you don't burn your hands as you do that. ASMR version. <laughs> we are. We just formed the tea. And we're passing it around. No, I've watched too much of that. Um, so. Is the one of somebody eating a pickle? No. That one. <laughs> what? So I can already smell this tea is really intense. And if you wanted it light and airy, that ship has passed. Um, so as we drink our tea, and as I tell everybody, both internet land and here, um, there are three wonderful things to enjoy about tea. When we think about tasting tea, we think of what is called pin cha. Pin cha is to not really taste tea, it's to pin chi. And pin is made up of three characters, you know, going back to that conversation of characters. Um, and the characters are all the same. There are three mouth radicals, little boxes. And in this case, think of enjoying tea or tasting tea three times. We're going to enjoy the, the color of the tea. We're going to enjoy the scent of the tea. And then finally, we enjoy the, the sort of flavor of the tea. It's okay to slurp. And you'll find it's going to be a pretty strong cup of tea. Because um, we use boiled water. I did not back down at this point. Um, we used a lot of tea in this case. When you go to a tea farm, this is how you assess tea, all right? When you go to a tea house, maybe not this tea house, we don't skimp on the tea here, um, but when you go to, let's say, more, I don't know how to say it, but if, you tr if you're trying to get into this tea and you've yet to, don't use a lot, use a little because there's a lot of flavor in these cu in these little tea nuggets. What you were saying about like the Riesling, um, like the fish yeah. is actually really spot on. It's like very yeah. like oxidized, <laughs> like tropical fruits, mm -hmm. like underneath all of like the really green yep. and like earthy notes. Yep. In so which situation you use a large amount of tea? In, in what situation or in each yeah, situation? In which? Um, I almost always, and I almost always, because I learned under somebody who mastered a style of what we'd call chao zhou gong tu cha, and that's typically, the end result is to produce sort of an espresso of tea. So every flavor that this tea has to offer is available to us right now. Um, whereas, let's say, not going to call it more conservative, but more gentle versions of brewing tea. Like, oh, I'm just going to sit back and drink some tea. Um, you're going to use less tea leaf, and you might use water that's very specific in the temperature. As you notice, I'm not like looking at any thermometer here. I'm not looking at a little clock or an egg timer or anything like that. What I'm looking at are the leaves. And what I know is that in the case of using a porcelain gaiwan, a lot of that heat is gonna dissipate. So I wanna bring the heat up really high. I wanna use a lot of leaves in this case because it's actually, this looks like a small gaiwan, but it's kinda of small, it's kinda of big. Um, and I want to make sure that, one, we're gonna be doing a shotgun round of drinking tea tonight. So I wanna make sure that we can at least get everything because what normally would take eight to 12 to 15 to sometimes 24 brews of this tea because it's that good, um, we're gonna try to push and try to do it maybe five. And we'll probably only drink three of these steepings. Otherwise, we're not going to sleep tonight. So, yeah. But you'll find, and you know, some people say in Chao Jokung Fu Cha, 
this regional version that comes from Chaozhou. You want each steeping to taste the same. I would say you want each steeping to have the quality that is indicative of what happens between first, second, and third, and fourth, and fifth steeping. And that is tea will have consistent flavors that you'll like from start to finish, but then there will also be flavors that emerge. And as we brew a tea from first, second, third steeping, it begins to open up, literally, as those leaves begin to open up. But also, the flavors begin to develop and sort of expose more. Um, and what it's exposing is what's going on in the interior of the tea leaf. Um, sort of a no-no in tea brewing is when they say, oh, you brewed the stems. And that's like, well, you've kind of gone past from brewing the leaf, and now you're brewing the woody part, um, and it's not really a good thing um, because you have kind of oversteeped it to the point where you're just tasting this kind of like, this tastes like a toothpick. You ever chewed on a toothpick? Um, it's kind of oaky in a bad way. do one more steeping of this and we'll start getting deeper and darker. So How many times would you re-steep it? The way that I'm steeping it right now probably <coughs> get about 7 to 12 yeah. steepings. Um, this is a tea that I'd probably give up before it would. So, um, And this tea comes by way of, I should say, um, a gentleman who's been sourcing tea now since the early 2000s um, in Napa, California. Um, I used to work with his, his partner when they were still working on this thing, and his partner taught me a lot of what I know about tea. Um, and the guy who brings it in now, his name is, is it David? Um, he's going to hate me for forgetting his name. Um, but the company's name is Tillerman Tea. Um, if you like Cat Stevens, you get the job. Um, but he focuses specifically on some amazing oolongs, and we'll be drinking two of them tonight. They say that in China, the teas are around the south part. Uh -huh. Yeah, mostly. In America, is there any like area of the tea? Yes. Um, actually, that's another thing I should mention. Um, California grows its own tea. Well, it grows tea in California. Um, Hawaii grows tea. Um, I think there's some in Oregon and Washington. Um, I think New York State now has some tea growing in it. Um, and a very, very old tea farm uh, from the 1850s, I want to say, maybe earlier, uh, can be found in uh, South Carolina. Um, uh, I will put the shout out right now. There's a gentleman by the name of Mike Fritz who uh, started a Golden Feather Tea Farm in California. Um, it is sadly no longer um, because it is uh, a victim of the fires that are going on there right now. So these mountains, the uh, Sierra Nevadas and, and the mountains around them are beautiful places to grow tea. Um, and he, he happened to be growing there for quite a while. He was using a Japanese varietal that came there in the 1800s um, and was making some amazing tea. Um, so check him out. Check out Golden Feather Tea because um, he could use some help and the end result is just really good tea. So. It's, it's difficult to tell if the flavor gets less intense because of the rinse of water or because of the sensation it gets down maybe. I also pulled back. <laughs> I was, the second I was being one, a little the second one was very bitter melon. Yes. Yeah, bitter melon. Yeah. Um the sort of uh watery bitterness. Yeah. Sharp and hits the back of your throat. Yes. That, I think, is more due to me being a little aggressive with this tea right now. I like it too, and I, I like that you like it because I used to make people sad when I brew too much. <laughs> I, so. I think it's like, you know, like in Asian culture, we're less averse to 
bitterness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like here, the way we have our beverages is typically with sugars and so on. So yes. people are kind of like shocked when they taste bitter. It's like, oh, like, yeah. am I supposed to? You know, yeah. <laughs> taste this. If you pass that around again, so if you can remember back when it was a little baby tea, now it's all grown up. Do you ever get the tea leaves like after you're done? Yes. Brewing them? Yes. Like, you don't go the way you, you usually eat them. Very Some well, I don't just chow down on them like it's throw some sriracha on there. Or, like, like go to town. Someone but, go to town. <laughs> with a whole batch of tea. I I couldn't do it with oolong though. Like with the green tea, I could, but that's just like. <laughs> I I want to be able to sleep tonight, maybe, and that's gonna be a one-way ticket to. Yeah. So let's get wild. Let's think yeah. 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 <laughs> so we're gonna brew a tea now um, that I really really love, and this is it is also the first tea that we brewed was from Taiwan. The second tea that we brewed is also from Taiwan. I'm a big fan of Taiwanese teas. Um, before we do, I'm just gonna grab this and throw at the camera. That's what it looks like, everybody, and we can open up. Once we're done, oh, there you go. You're gonna be very, very good. Um, we're gonna open it up. We're gonna, yeah, yeah. yeah. You wanna, we can do it now. Um, also, if anybody wants to like go home with these teas, please do because there's like a lot more tea to be consumed from these leaves. That's what you get when you come to the event and you're not looking at it online, folks. You get to go home with choice teas. So. Um, well, can these teas be used? You can still brew this. Like, if you put this in a little Dixie cup, or if you, you know, tuck it away in a thermos, that's still very good tea. Um, what I like to do is I'll go down to my local Starbucks, and I'll get one of their cheap, you know, paper cups, put that in, fill it up with water, and then put a little, you know, classic coffee top lid on, and that lid becomes all of a sudden the perfect filter for this tea. Because these leaves, if we want to look at them, come from here, and we get that one. Give me a nicer one because the light will be. There we go. Very, very consistent looking though. Um, with a Taiwanese oolong, typically you're going to have multiple leaves, about three or four on one stalk. Um, and what we see here is a larger maintenance leaf. This is the leaf that helps the plant kind of grow and maintain itself. Um, you have a smaller leaf, which kind of at one point wrapped itself around a sprout, and then you have a tiny, tiny leaf and a tiny, tiny sprout. And all of that's going into producing that really, really complex flavor. Okay, I have three large leaves. And you have three pretty large leaves. So they're, you know, even in a consistent tea, you might find some slight inconsistencies. But, but these are generally pretty big. This would be like the growing one? Yep. And the second and then? Yep. So that one's a monster. This one's from Alishan? Alishan, yep. Yeah. Where's Yushan in the map? Where's Yushan? Um, Jade Mountain? I think it's also center. I think it is... You have... I'm trying to remember. Um, you have Alishan, and then does it go Lishan, and then you have Sanlingshi kind of in between. And I think Yushan is around there too. I haven't been there, so I don't know. I'm a bad tea person. <laughs> so, um, if you brew like the same tea in Yixing Pa enough, can it absorb the flavor so much that you just put hot water in there? That's the old story, and I would say yes, because we can heat up this, and I want you to smell the result of just heating up that teapot. But we'll do that delicately because so this is this is Scott's favorite little teapot. So. <laughs> This teapot was given to me by a teacher as I was like really learning like arduously how to make tea and this teapot within its first year brewed pounds and pounds of that specific tea. Of this, this dark roasted tea guan yun. Um, to the point where it was like you will learn how to make this tea. Um, and that was how I learned how to make this tea so I'm just going to pass it like this. Slight? Yeah. It's there. The echo. I normally pass this around, but at some point, 
in the early 2000s, I got on the bandwagon of saying like, I gotta tie a string to it. And then that made it very, very clumsy to pass around. But when you're starting off making tea, it's fun to make a little lanyard on it. And it also helps to make your hand not burn when you're holding the teapot. So we'll go through the classic ways of how to make this tea. First off, I warm the teapot, both the inside by pouring water inside of it, and then the outside by pouring water on the outside of it. Now it's ready to brew some tea. So for you, temperature isn't as important then? I'm listening to this teapot, right. and I'm waiting to see some little steam go up from there. At that point, I'll know that it's getting close or at boiling. When it actually gets a little quiet, or it goes like, which it is kind of doing right now, um, that's it saying, I'm at full boil. And there's actually a poetic term that's used to describe that sound. It's the sound of the wind passing through the pines. So if you've ever been in a pine forest, like the ones that are burning down in uh, California right now, um, these will be, uh, that will train your, your ear to the sound of water boiling. So go out and walk the forest. What's this process, what's this called again? Yeah, no, it's the Wulong uh, Wulong. That's the, the dark, the black dragon, Wulong, and then Wulong, which is it going into Wulong, the palace, yes. Now some, some parts of China, they will not use this thing. All right, this is just a piece of bamboo. Um, that's been carved, you know, cut and written upon. It's actually trying to look very much like a scholar's sort of wrist rest, all right? This is Japanese from the turn of the century, uh, turn of the 20th century, um, but it's done in a style that is similar to Chinese, uh, you know, manner of making tea. You um, said Gyokuro earlier, right? So Gyokuro is Japanese, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And Gemaicha is also? Gemaicha is also Japanese, yeah. Um, but what you'll find in some cultures, going back to this silly scoop, is sometimes they use paper too. They'll take a piece of paper, they'll wrap it, kind of turn it into an inverted cone, and they'll go shh, and that uh, black dragon will enter the palace that way. Some people do, as you saw, you know, leaf by leaf. So all different things. I don't really want to rinse this tea. You guys are okay with that. So, uh, but the way that I'm doing it, if you remember that little diagram, kind of doing that in a spiral, and then I go up. The upward motion means that the water that's going in goes a little bit faster and a little bit more, you know, oomph to it, and that lets the tea leaves spin in the tea pot. You know, what we're waiting for is for a couple of things. One, it's the water that's going to dissipate off the side. All right, so you have poured water over the top. Second, oh my gosh, that little meniscus bubble just went down to the little spout. It happened really quickly. That's telling me that the leaves are beginning to move around. They're beginning to open up and they're beginning to absorb water and take it in and you know, open up air pockets and let that happen. That happened really quickly though in this teapot. So it's a number of reasons why that would happen. Water's really hot. Other reason though is that maybe they're just, you know, a little bit more movement going on. What I'm going to wait for at this point is for this teapot to slightly change color, which it kind of already did, where it became at first kind of dull, and then it became slightly, in this case, kind of tomatoey, like slightly redder, like a tomato is red. And I'm seeing that meniscus actually begin to crawl its way back. It comes crawling back. Open. Um, and there it goes again popping right back up. So this tea is more or less ready. Because it's roasted, it's definitely ready. And if I, it's gonna get its flavor. That roasty flavor is gonna be there. And if I feel like it's not stronger than what I want it, I will pull back. See how I'm kind of modulating the pour? If I knew it was ready though, I'd go straight down. All right? So, but this tea is pretty much ready. Usually, usually made so small. Like, do you usually buy like bigger? Like, you'll see big teapots like that. I have a Venetian teapot that's this big, okay. but you know, that's if I'm like making tea for everybody. Yeah. You know, 
Um, the entire world gets to have tea from that tea pot. Um, but we also have smaller teapots. I have a teapot that would maybe fill that cup. I brought a teapot tonight, which is maybe half the size of this teapot. So we'll see. Yeah, they get really cute. Yeah, you know, like right over there. There's colored small ones. Thank you. And the funny thing is that this, there's more tea in there. Um, the funny thing is, so the small as these look, they're actually pretty big. You know, I think this has greater volume than that guy one easily. So, but it doesn't really look that way for some reason. fermented than the last, right? Or no? It's it's about the same in terms of oxidation. Yeah. 30% oxidized, but it's higher roast. And the roast that they do to this, the guy who's making this is really good. And so he does not roast it really, really high heat. He doesn't use a charcoal that imparts a flavor. And he's probably pit, uh, doing ash pit roasting um, over a long period of time. And so when you look at this, we'll pull it out afterwards, maybe. Um, we'll, we'll look at it and we'll see, like if you look at these leaves, these are really low oxidized, maybe, maybe 20%. You know, they're pretty green and they're not really roasted. They're baked, but they're not roasted. Um, this one on the other hand is trying to be darker. It's trying to be toastier. It's trying to be roasty. But it's doing that for a very, very purposeful reason. In this tea, the tea itself, if you left it green, I'm going to give you a little nip of the first. Um, if you just had this as a green oolong, which a lot of modern, you know, tea uh, guan yin are, they're very, very green. They taste like you know, you just ran through a field of marigolds and somebody was cutting grass. You know, it's very floral, but very, very grassy and kind of not in a great way. And the flavor dissipates very quickly. You might get three good steepings out of it and then it's done. The roasting of a tia guanyin, the traditional roasting of a tia guanyin was layered to harness that flavor, that beautiful marigold, that beautiful, I'm going to call sort of dry apricot note that we're getting in this to take it and preserve it in and modern, balance it the nice. modern way <clears throat> of making tea guan yin, mm -hmm. i never really felt the connection the name to yeah. the flavor yeah. that i was tasting but this one makes a lot more sense somehow mm -hmm. with the name that it's given yep so tia guan yin means iron bodhisattva Sounds like an awesome name for like a hairband. But um, at the same time, you're right. There's something, when we think of iron, when we think of really strong iron and that sort of ferrous quality to it, like if you've ever made tea using an iron pot or if you've made food with an iron skillet, it imparts a flavor. And it's this very kind of almost fire forward, um, slightly charcoaly, but also slightly metallic note to it. And that's what you're finding in here. Um, there's an elemental quality of this that I think is not in modern Tiaguanyin, and it's a shame. This is a Taiwanese Tiaguanyin. This guy's preserving a very, very old style of tea that if you go to the mainland in China, you will be hard pressed to find. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of this one. Yeah. So we're waiting for the second steeping. The meniscus bubble will still show when you roast a tea like this though, it really doesn't want to open up more than that first. So at this point, we're just playing the waiting game. 
um, knowledge of brewing this tea many, 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 many times over will train you to say like, okay, it's ready. You become the egg timer, all right? Um, but that meniscus is coming down, so I gotta push this a little bit more because I think it was slightly shy in that first steeping. Typically, this will have a very, very bronze hue to it. I showed a picture earlier, you saw three cups in a teapot. That was a style of tea. Um, that was a Chinese varietal, which I have here um, from a local tea vendor. Um, this one, I'm, I'm not gonna make that. This is more my style. Um, somebody took their time with this, and it's shown. Um, we'll come back to this too later in the night after we taste all of these, and I want you to know how a good tea stands up to other teas, all right? The reason why you wanna do that is because that's gonna teach your palate. Same reason that if you go to like a wine school, they make you taste different wines from different regions, so you'll kind of memorize things, the muscle memory of that. This why typically more. people think this type is better? You know, I think a bunch of old dudes might think this is better. I think a lot of young folks don't know this tea. Um, I like this a lot because if I breathe out over my palate, right, my mouth is closed, but I'm breathing through my mouth. And so it's kind of breathing into the cavity of my mouth. I'm not tasting the first tea we had, all right? And I brewed that tea very, very strong, that first tea that we had. What I'm tasting is this. It's replaced it. And there's a complexity in this tea that Although the first tea was excellent, um, there's something to this tea that I'm finding that I didn't find in that first one. And I like that. And it's a matter of taste. I like this type of tea. It's complex, it's earthy, it's bright, it's floral, spicy. It's like modern tea farmers today, I mean, like what's their place in society? Like is it kind of like, is it like revered? Are people just kind of like roll their eyes? Like what is it? I think it's a mix. Um, you know, what you get when you go to a tea farm is it, all different things. Some yeah. people have been in tea farming their whole life and their family has been in it their whole life and, you know, they have that generational quality. Are they in it for the money, I guess, or are they, they're yeah. truly artists? I think a lot of people are always into something for the money. They want it to be at least sustainable, you know? Like, this needs to sustain me or I can't eat. Because yeah. it is in the middle of a very rural place. You can't make tea in, in or next to a city. It just doesn't make good tea. So you are already, you know, out in the, sometimes out in the jungle, sometimes out in the, you know, very, very rural part of China, um, even though it's famous for what it's producing. Um, so, you know, um, are they living comfortably? Some are, some are not. Um, some are artists, some are not. Um, some are in it for a quick buck. You know, Dona didn't like working in the city, so they're like, I'll become a tea farmer. I like tea, you know, but they might not know anything about it. They might have read about it in a book and are making a lot of mistakes along the way. You know, they don't have the, the generational learning that sometimes is required for tea. Um, the guy who makes this, I am certain that his family has been making tea for a long time, and his family taught him how to make this tea for a long time. Um, so, when I went, the next tea that we'll drink, um, made in Chaozhou, um, on Wudanshan, um, comes from an area where, when I first went to China in search of tea, I we stumbled across a guy, uh, my friend So Han Fan, and my other friend, um, Steve O'Dell, both of whom now own tea houses in uh, Austin, Texas, with Sohan Fan, owner of West China Tea Company, and uh, one of the founders of Guanyin Tea House. If you're down there, check it out, because we went to where this tea was grown. And the guy who was growing this tea has been in a family that's been growing this tea for 600 years. Um, so it's, it's super important. No, the next one, the next one. So families will retain this knowledge and pass it on. Do you find that like most families only make like one specific type of tea? They're not like, I don't know, like 
diversifying? Yes and no. Like it's better to be really good at one thing than okay at everything? I think, I think some people think that and some people don't. Um, I find it's more the former, less the latter, yeah. um, is what I prefer. So what do we think about the second C thing? I don't more iron. <laughs> it makes so much more sense because all this time I've been having the very clean and very floral tea yeah. onions and just the name and the tea flavor just didn't make sense to me. And this one, it kind of, I feel it here. Yeah. yeah. It's like very here. <laughs> I yeah. don't know how else to describe it. something earlier that in in the culture where this is coming from bitterness is not necessarily a bad thing mm -hmm. it's it's part of a bigger picture of flavors um, and so when bitterness is presented if it's there in balance with a lot of other things it's great um, if it's dominating it overshadows and so when we brew a tea like this using a teapot like this what we're trying to do is we're trying to balance out flavors with if we apply heat here, if we let it wait here, if we you know pour a certain way, we can express it to the point where those big flavors slightly subside and allow for more complex, more nuanced flavors to exist alongside with it. If you let it brew for too long, those bigger flavors will overshadow those smaller flavors. And that could either be a big bitter flavor or a big like too roasty of a flavor, especially of a roasted tea guan yin. Um, but in this case, it's, you know, you just pull back at the right moment. That's what happens. For water, do you do anything like special? Um, I think New York is pretty blessed with decent tap yeah. water. Um, if you notice, every time I pour water out of this, I pour water into this. And that's so I'm not overboiling the water, and you're not quiet sound real quick um, when you pour the cold water in there. Reason why I do that, reason why I don't want to overboil water, is because you're gonna sort of deoxidant, bust this word up, deoxygenate it. I think is the right word. Um, it kind of comes off as tasting a little flat. All right. Deoxygenate. So when you deoxygenate, deoxygenate, <laughs> deoxygenate, so um, <laughs> in post production we'll put it right here. Yeah. No, um, so um, I don't have that skill. Um, but as we deoxygenate the water, it kind of loses something that water should have, and that's a slight, almost effervescent flavor to it. You know, and the aliveness. the aliveness of it, and it will gain that as you boil it. But if you let it boil for too long, it will, classically speaking, it will it will let the wind out of the water, um, which is pretty scientific when you think about it. Um, and tea people knew this to the point where back in the Tang period, they talked about this. Yu Yu talks about boiling water. And the stages and you can go read that book if you want to hear his poetic allusions to it but at the end of the day he talks about when water essentially ripens uh, kind of like how a fruit ripens other tea scholars like uh, uh, 
Chung of the what was it, 1800s, 1830s. Uh, Korea talked about this uh, in his treatise, the Dashin Jong. Um, other writers all throughout T's history talk about what happens when water comes to a boil and then potentially overboils. And one of the ways that you can remedy that is by adding a little bit more water into it. So. I'm a big fan. I think third's key. I would have said first, but like, I think third's where it's at. Nice. This is a good marriage between the first two. Mm -hmm. When you say keep the wing in the water, do you mean like yeah. when the water are staining? Um, it's more of the, the sort of breath leaves it, sort of the vitality of it is gone. Um, some might call it chi. So like you would you wouldn't say like the point of water is to be completely tasteless. No, exactly. Okay. And and some fun stories around tea. I'll give you one. There's a there's a kid running through the mountains. You know, back in the day, and he's this young, you know, uh, probably you know scholar dude who thinks he knows everything. <laughs> and he goes to this monastery late at night, and you know, like oh, you know, I gotta gotta make sure that these guys know I'm cool because I'm young and when I'm young everybody better think I'm cool. Um, <laughs> they hand him a cup of tea and he's having it hard the whole night. He's like, what tea did they give me? Because if I say, you know, I'll tell them what tea it is, ah, oh, they'll think I'm so cool. And later, you know, that evening he's like, the tea was from this mountain, from this side, you know, I knew it. And they're like, yeah, but where's the water from? <laughs> you know, I'm not cool. Um, and, you know, water is the mother of tea. Um, Liu Yu himself was, Liu Yu is this tea sage from the Tang period. He wrote one of the first books on tea, the first book, Compendium on Tea, um, the Cha Jing. There's an incident, in, uh, sort of anecdotal part of the history that he's going to have tea and he's going to make tea for somebody and they send a servant off to go get some water. And he's like, I want you to go get the water from the center of that, you know, lake. Why the center? Because stuff floats to the top and we don't want that part. Stuff is scummy on the bottom, we don't want that part. We want it from the center, you know? In Japanese tea ceremony, you scoop water from the center, you know, you don't scoop it from the top. Um, so he said, go scoop it from the center and bring it back and we'll make some tea. Later, they make some tea, and he's like, you didn't scoop it from the center. And they're like, but I did. You know, the guy was like, really saying I did. And the guy who went with him to help him scoop into this big vessel, he said, actually, at one point, some of the water dripped out of it. And I, you know, quickly replenished it with some water from the side of the, from the side of the lake, I'm sorry. He's like, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> What's that? It's, it's quite it's, serene, yeah. yes. It's, like, you find that different teas invokes different emotions. Mm -hmm. Some teas just kind of start making you giggle. Mm -hmm. Some teas are very, it's, it stays out here and makes you very introspective and mellow. Mm -hmm. So it's good to observe what's happening in your body as you're drinking the tea. It's really another way to appreciate tea. Mm -hmm. Cha chi. The energy of the tea. Um, Do you find that when you go to like a small farm mm -hmm. where like the water is potentially different than you have it like back in New York City? Mm -hmm. Do you find that no matter what you do, like no matter how you brew it the same way, yeah. that it tastes different? Yeah. This inferior, better, different? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so we're gonna brew this next tea, and I, the the tea that we're gonna brew next is what we call Yo uh, Yo Hua Xiang or in this case, a lao yu hua shang. It means old pomelo flower scented tea or fragrance tea. Um, when I went through Chaozhou with my two tea buddies, Steve O'Dell and Sohan Fan, Steve O'Dell, who now opened Mthea Tea House in Portland, Oregon, the cutest, most beautiful tea house to grace that town now. <laughs> um, I need to go visit it. So this one's um, from, sorry. This is, this is from, so this is from this tea house, oh, yeah. but when we, when Steve O'Dell, Sohan Fan, and myself went to uh, Chaozhou for the first time, we went to where this was made. 
and instantly we fell in love with this tea. And I think it was largely because the water there was so delicious. Yeah. Because we were on the farm, right outside of the processing station, and they made us a guy one full where the guy one was just stuffed. And they're like, drink that. And it was just like, you know, fruit punch in the face. Yeah. Because it was an inescapable flavor. And we we're just like, yes, we need this tea. We need to bring this back. And we need like everybody who's never had this tea to have this tea because it was so beautiful, so intense. Um, and it had this very precise flavor to it. Now, granted, this is a different tea in some sense because you know, it might be coming from a different farm, but it's coming from the same mountain. So we're getting very close. And, but we're making it with New York tap water. So it will be slightly different, but we're gonna try it's to get filtered. close. It's filtered. We do our best. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's still coming from a natural source. You know, it's, it's not going through, you know, some crazy, um, I don't know, it's careful. Do you, uh, have you ever tried making Do I use it with different mineral waters? Like, have you tried making tea with different? Like a like Poland spring? Um, okay. Exactly. Um, <laughs> no, I, I have, I have. Um, and I've used natural mineral waters too because, you know, these come from natural sources. Um, when I was living in France for a long time, I'd use the famous mineral waters that you could find. And they're good, but you taste the mineral. Okay. There's a lot yeah. of mineral in central. Yeah, yeah. It's and very heavy. It's very heavy. Um, sometimes, too, you'll get across waters that come out of, you know, uh, municipal sources that are very, very um, calcium rich. And you'll taste, it kind of tastes a little chalky. Um, so, tea prefers water that's pretty basic. If, if the water is slightly sweet, that's good. Because tea kind of prefers something a little bit sweeter than slightly, you know, I don't know what the word is, alkaline or metallic. Um, and you can go and, you know, if you're at home, there are some ways that classically you can remedy this. You can put in a stick of active bamboo and that will help kind of bring back the life of it. Some people use a sand filter. I'm not a big fan of that. Some, Charcoal is perfect. Um, uh, if you really want to, you know, uh, spend some Benjamins, uh, you can go and get a silver tea kettle because apparently silver makes tea taste really good. And I can actually attest to that because I've had tea served to me from a, a kettle that was silver. Um, when I was in Korea, they were really into it, and I was like, you know, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really into it. I was like, it, it really tastes good. Um, so, you know, why not? Um, and, and that's something that had been learned uh, in the Tong period. Again, Lu Yu writing about using silver in his tea kettle and vessels. Um, some people say gold too, but I think that's like. What about copper? Copper, good question. Copper tends to give a flavor. And so I don't really like copper that much. Now that said, I've had some amazing Yunnan tea that was brewed to me, or served to me, and brewed in a vessel made of copper. They boil the water in this vessel. But before they do that, they put the tea leaves in the empty vessel, they put the vessel over a flame, and they roast the tea in that copper vessel. Then they put the water in it, and it boils, and it served that way. It is crazy, but it is crazy good. So, so copper is okay, but you do taste a little bit of it. So I wouldn't... You can smell it too, you know, different metals. Yeah. Like silver, yeah. there's less of a smell yeah. compared yeah. to copper. Yeah. So I'm not going to close this tea up just yet, but really quick, look at the foam on that. Um, in Chaozhou, Gong Fu Cha, Depending on who you're with, they say scrape off that foam or keep the foam. The foam is largely tea oil, so I'm of the mind of not scooping it off. 
But there are people who say scoop it off because they say it's impurities. So different strokes for different folks. It would probably make sense with lower grade teas. Yes, yes, because there's a lot of detritus and, and dust and mucky things in there. So I'm gonna brew this a lot faster. You notice that meniscus is completely down, the water is completely dissipated. If I let this steep any longer, we're gonna oversteep this tea. So I'm gonna pour this out very quickly right now. And it, brews, it, it pours a little bit slower because we're doing this in what's called a robien, which means lump of meat teapot. It's so good. All right, so this teapot that we used is the first one, the pear-shaped one. We could call that the, the pear-shaped pot. But we don't. In Chinese tea, we call this a si ting. Because there is a potter named Si Ting, and he made this shape and he became famous, and now we attach his name to the shape. So Si Ting Hu, it's a pear shaped pot. Um, some people, if it's a little squatter, I think they call it a Meng Chen, Meng Chen pot, but don't quote me on that. Um, very, very nice teapot. This is what we call a robian. Looks like a lump of meat. You just take your, your roll, your meat, you go, looks like this. This is very, very nice for this type of tea. And I do want to pass this around, but it's also like going to give everybody a big blister on their fingers. So do it nicely. Um, what's really, really nice about this teapot is that for those long, wiry leaves that we just put in that teapot, I should explain all of this beforehand, but long wiring leaves, slightly smaller. Um, um, they fit very nicely into this pot, all right? Big opening, smaller opening, smaller leaves, or at least rolled up leaves. As this tea brews, the major difference between the first tea that we brewed or the, you know, the tea we brewed before this and this other tea that we brewed is this tea, the tea guanyin, was rolled. And so when it opens up, it's going to open up, all right? It's going to open upward instead of when you have a long twisted tea leaf, and I'm going to use this Wu Yishan Yan Cha, it likes to open outward. So when you get these long twisted leaves, typically go for something that wants to open outward rather than upward. So a wider pot will serve you better. Pass this around. Really careful because it's pretty hot. Would you like a cup of tea? Yeah. Yeah. Like a cup of tea. Yeah. So how do you feel about like milk and tea or like honey and tea or anything else? like is that like you taste this tea and let me know if you would be able to taste this tea with milk or honey or sugar in it. Or if it even needs it. And that's typically what my answer is. I have friends who say like it's like adding salt to food. They're like, I yeah. just put a little bit of like honey in it just to kind of like bring out the flavor. I I think a lot of that conflicts with these flavors. Yeah. Um and I also think um not only does it conflict, but they're also really strong flavors. Like honey. Like I, I had a spoonful of honey the other day and I was like boom in my face. Yeah. Like there's enough going on in honey for Pretty me strong. to go like, honey, yeah. Um, <laughs> didn't mean that, um, not that way. Um, or milk, which, you know, all of a sudden kind of creates a different viscosity. Um, and the, the, the lipids in milk and the other components in milk will change the flavor. So what you're tasting in this will be gone. Mm. So this pot has been making tea in it for 10 years now, this pot probably 10 or 11, 12 years, all the same, oh sorry, um, so they absorb that flavor all the time. What's that etiquette with mm. tea leaves and the drinking cup? As in? It's like... <coughs> Is it something that is frowned upon? Mm, good question. So when I'm pouring tea to you, 
unless I'm pouring it directly from the pot into the cup, which you find in some parts of China they do, and they just go, you know, cup, 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 cup. Um, if you're pouring it into an intermediary vessel, in this case we're using a Korean sukwo, um, in, in China you use what's called a gong gao bei. Um, if you pour this correctly, you will not get tea leaves in a cup. And I'm trying, as I'm pouring it, not to get tea leaves in the cup. When I look in my cup, I get a few tea leaves, but that's because I'm serving myself and I don't mind. So typically you don't want a tea leaf or tea dust, in this case, in the cup. Um, sometimes it's a little unavoidable. Sometimes you get the surprise one whole leaf of tea and it's like, oh, that's cute. Um, and in some parts of, you know, Chinese culture and East Asian culture, they'll say that's good luck. And that's probably just going like, you know, all right, you got the... Apparently if it's floating like mm -hmm. so, it's a good indication of <laughs> There's that too, um, especially with green teas or some yellow teas. They're like, oh, if it floats like a, like a, uh, what is it, a spear pointing upward, everybody gets really excited because <laughs> um, it's like, shows that it's like properly balanced and it's like a perfect leaf and, and you'll see it when when you get that perfect little leaf floating in that teacup or if you're brewing it you know how most people brew their tea when you take a tumbler just like that fill it with tea leaves and then pour water over it and all of a sudden they're all aligning in the same direction it's like that is a uniform cup of tea that means that every leaf if they're all pointing upward like that which you will see it in a good like mojing or a good uh Know, ganlu or a good huan cha ma feng. That means that each leaf is shape-wise the same, um, weight the same, and so the aqua dynamics enables that to happen. And it's just kind of like somebody's doing their doing a really good job processing that tea. Do you take a picture of that and post it to Instagram? I haven't done that in a long time, but <laughs> I did that before Instagram was a thing. I was like, oh, yeah. is it like a hole in one? Like it's like you'll see it you'll see it and if you go online if you go on on and just like look up on phone or look up you know green tea and then you see the leaves sitting in a tumbler glass it's pretty it's very pretty so it's like do any of these like farmers that are experimenting with like like floral scents like do they like like put jasmine do they like mix their teas mm -hmm. like that or is it again just like a pure they leave a pure yeah, so it depends on the tea you're making. Um, are certain teas, like, it's more, like, like married to jazz, like a jasmine flavor, like a floral flavor? There are white teas that you'll see okay. oftentimes. There are some green teas that you'll see oftentimes. There's even poor and, and red teas that will have that. Um, it's usually, if it's well done, what they'll do is they'll actually not put the jasmine flower in it. They'll just have a network of baskets where you have tea and jasmine, tea, jasmine, tea, jasmine, and the diffusion of that flavor from one layer to the next uh, allows for that flavor to enter the tea leaf. And so when you brew the tea, you're brewing that flavor out of it. Um, and that way it's, it's actually a true pairing versus if you're mixing you know, a flower in it or if you're scenting it with a spray um, the flower will brew differently than the tea. The spray will just come off in the first steeping, you know, so, and these were things that people figured out long, long ago. And, you know, if you're lucky, you'll come across somebody who's still making tea like that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Two drops. <laughs> Bottoms up, folks. Um, so what are we getting in this tea? Um, tell me, since there's... And you can smell the cup too after you're done drinking from it. There's something called a cold scent of Longshan in that. I a lot of like florals and then kind of like kind of the honey, mm -hmm. but not actually honey. Yeah. Not like, oh, that's honey. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah.
you're mixing like um, like a white tea with jasmine, do the farmers like grow the jasmine and the tea, or they like kind of like Sometimes. outsource one or the other? Um, a lot of times they're growing them pretty close to each other. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, historically, that's just because there are like jasmine makers and like tea makers. Sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. people do that if if you live in a culture that doesn't typically put honey or milk in something they if they want that effect on a tea that doesn't actually have that flavor they would add things like chrysanthemum they would add things chrysanthemum tastes like honey when you yeah, put it in water yeah. um, dried citrus peels yep yeah, yep yeah. a lot of times pours will receive a dry citrus peel um, that bitter flavor that we like from that very first tea that sort of bitter melon flavor um, you can also get through ginseng, especially white ginseng. Um, it used to be back in the Song period, they would actually scent the tea with incense. And so you would actually taste, you know, a little bit of camphor, a little bit of uh, aloes wood, a little bit of sandalwood. Um, yeah, so how, how do you now then, going back to your point about like there's a little bit more artistry if you can actually just find that flavor in the tea and then grow it so it expresses that flavor, there are teas that will do that. And this, this next tea, um, which I don't actually want to be, I don't want that to be our last tea, I don't know how much time it is, but I'm here, so it's a private, I'm going to stick around until it's done. So. <laughs> Um, I think that was a little bit more floral, but I did manage to it a little bit too. Um, um, what we'll find in this next tea, which is one of my favorite teas as well, I bring only the favorite teas, um, it will be slightly incensey. It will have a lot more going on in terms of roasty, toasty flavors too. So if you like that roasted Tianyuan, I think you might like this as well. Um, in terms of how we'll brew it, again, each one is slightly different. Um, in terms of what we'll brew it with, well, folks, we're gonna use the smallest pot of the day. So if you like a big cup of tea, you're not gonna have it right now. So um, we can also mix some steepings too. This, uh, go Does for it. this guy always do that? Like, you know how the tear kind of moves in the current? Like this little oh, yeah. thing when you put the water, you put the lid on, it doesn't close completely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, does that possibly? Yeah, it, it, it goes like, boop, 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 boop. Yeah. Um, Because as you're brewing this, this is a funny, funny teapot um, because it has a flat top to it. So, you have to work with it in some ways. One is if you put water into it, any residual air, because it's hot air, the minute that you put this on top is going to start puffing the top off. So you'll see it kind of dance a That's little awesome. bit. Yeah. Um, and if you, um, I'm trying to think of what else this does, if you pour water over the top, you don't look at that water as a means to tell you is the tea ready because it will always want to sit there instead you look at the water that dissipates off the side of it um, because it's going to be slightly cooler on the top or at least slightly you know still have more water sitting with it so um, both of these teapots actually and, and this one as well come from a tea house in san francisco um, called imperial tea court they were all commissioned by one man um, who starting in the late 
80s, early 90s, opened a tea house in San Francisco and started really dialing in how to make Gong Fu Cha not only accessible to people, but also bring tea to them in a sort of unadulterated way. Like, this is how they do that where it's made. Um, and so he started commissioning Yixing teapots specifically to uh, facilitate people learning about tea and doing so in a way that was one-to-one -one, uh, what you would find in China um, at a high level, not on sort of a, you know, oh, let's put some cheap teapots in there. Um, so these are, to me, kind of like my precious tools for making tea because like this one I've had for maybe 15 years, longer than this one. And if we can pass this around, just as you're, as you're holding it, just hold the two parts. It has this crazy thing. So um, the clay that this is being made of is what's called jirma duani, and that means sesame seed uh, duani, which is usually a yellow or white or grayish cast clay. Um, why sesame seed? Well, they've blended this with black clay and with a little bit of like a yellow and white clay. So it kind of looks like if you take sesame seeds and paste, turn it into a paste, grind it down into a paste, that's the color it will produce. So they call it jirma How do you clean a teapot usually? Boiling water. Just boiling water. Um, never anything else because the clay is porous and it will absorb any flavor that you have either in it or near it. So I even keep my incense away from these teapots because they'll end up smelling like incense. Um, I don't keep them in the kitchen. I like maybe have one teapot in the kitchen. All of them end up going into a tea chest and I keep them close to the teas that I make. So in my tea chest, it's, it's how many stacks? There's one stack for canisters, and then everything else, which is in sort of a permeable, permeable paper or cardboard. Um, I'll have one level for oolongs, one level for dark oolongs, and then one level for pour. And every level I keep my teapots with too. So the tea and the teapot live together. So for oolong, you can, uh, those age better. So basically anything that's gone through more oxidation mm -hmm. has the ability to age and develop flavors as it ages, mm -hmm. or just age and stay where it was. It can, and it will age, and it will it will s become quieter. But as it becomes quieter, the last tea we'll make tonight is an aged tea, so we can answer some questions with that. But as a tea ages, and this next tea that we're going to make is a great tea to age, because it is, as you said, higher oxidation. But they've also roasted it, so there's, it's kind of, it has a flavor that it will retain as well. Um, and that roastiness over the years will actually dissipate. And some tea masters, the people who roast the tea, will say, don't drink the tea the first year, or let it wait a couple of months, because they want you to not taste that really intense charcoal or that really intense fire note. Instead, they want you to wait till that airs out, until it turns into something else, in, turn, in, in a way that it kind of um, breathes out. And what's left is a flavor that is much more uh, complex, because that bigger flavor of the roast has sort of subsided. Um, before we move on to this tea. Let's pull some of this out. See, I like to use my my hands, which I promise you I clean before I do all this. Subway hands. <laughs> um, think of that as we're drinking tea. Um, so look at this leaf, compare it to the first leaf that we looked at. Looks like you Gentlemen ate your leaves. Very good. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no one compare. So, <laughs> it was good. I, I like to use your leaves. I'm a fan. So compare that. And I'll wait some time. I'll pull out one leaf because I'm going to be greedy and I'm going to go home and I'll brew more of this tea. But 
That's what a roasted oolong will look like when it's fully roasted. You can't really see, there's, if you pull it apart, you might see some color to it. It'll be slightly green, but like really, 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 really dark green. What we're not seeing in this, if we pull apart this really dark leaf, are weird tears to it, weird scorch marks, weird sort of like cuts in the leaf. And instead what we see is a whole leaf and a leaf that's been very well handled. So it was like massaged or? It was massaged, but it wasn't done so in a, in a vigorous way or in a harsh way. So this would probably be a good indication of like fully hand made tea. This, this one is assuredly hand done from start to finish. Um, when we look at the Feng Huan Dan Tong, the, the last tea that we just brewed, what I want you to do is compare it to the to that green leaf that you're seeing. And on that, you will see very, very distinctive patterns of oxidation. Where you see that redness is where oxidation occurs. Where you see the tea no longer green, but instead um, kind of slightly golden yellow, that's oxidation too. And it's gonna be different from the form of oxidation that we'll see in this next tea too. So does more oxidation equal more caffeine? No. Is that yeah. they're all about they're all about the same amount of caffeine. Because we really haven't done anything to reduce the caffeine. Caffeine is water soluble, and at no point are we bringing these into contact with water. If anything, we want to dry them out. So what is the temperature difference between um, roasting and then like baking? Um Roasting is generally there to be slightly higher, um, and it really depends on the tea. Uh, it's going to be probably more direct and less atmospheric. Like when you're baking, the whole room is baking. When you're roasting, it's you're putting it closer to a heat source, if that makes sense. So, but it's gonna differ depending on the types of tea that you're using. This one is roasted and it's also baked. So they're doing both and they know that one is gonna be there to impart a more charcoal note flavor to it. And one is going to impart more of a kind of, um, almost like biscuit note. Um, and you'll taste this, if you ever taste like a Shan style red tea, uh, or if you taste like a, like a chi gan or a, or a ginger mei, or if you try a Yunnan style, um, uh, what is this? Uh, golden nail. Or golden eyebrow. Golden eyebrow. We've got those, yes. Um, you will find that these tend to be a little bit more biscuity, a little bit more honey, and a little bit more chocolate note to them. And that's because a lot of them don't ever receive that much of a high fire heat. Some of them do, and you'll taste it, but a lot of them are more baked. So I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, um, it's, wait, what are we doing? Oolong, oolong. Oolong, oolong, oolong. Gong. 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 There's a style of tea called gong ting. And gong is the same gong in that case. It just means palace, like imperial palace. So, so I'm going to not rinse this because I don't like rinsing my twisted leaves. These leaves are not rolled, they're twisted. That's why they're like little dragons rather than like little pellets. And I put a lot of tea in this, so it's going to take a little bit to get in there. And I always pour water over. So the reason you're pouring water over is, I mean, it's basically to see it evaporate so you know when it's ready. But we're also superheating the teapot. Okay. So it serves a purpose in two ways. One, just like you said. Yep. Um, just like you said, it's going to help me visually see, is this tea ready? But also, functionally, it also is making this very, very hot. And Yishin clay, 
has a pretty high heat capacity. Like I'm burning my finger as I do that. So, um, yeah. And I'm just waiting for it to pull slightly, but these twisted leaf teas um, don't really open up as dramatically as these rolled teas. So they're a little bit more subtle. So it's more or less ready. How do you roll a tea leaf? There's twisting method where you're kind of rolling it along and then there's the pellet rolling method which is mostly through uh, as you roll them into uh, in that sort of cloth sack that I mentioned uh, okay. and as you continue that process and then you tumble roll them they'll naturally kind of roll together and the more hand processed you see these the less tight they tend to be. Okay. So, so like not everyone's like, like there, that, yeah, there are there is hand shaping that there is what hand shaping that goes on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, how do people <laughs> there is a lot of hand shaping that goes on and when you get into other types of tea, like let's say um, if there's more of this thing, I'll make sure you like it. Um, as you get into some very specific tea forms, like um, uh, Taiping Hokwe, uh, which is flat, very famously flat and long green teas. Historically and traditionally, those are all done by hand. They're all flattened by hand. So each leaf is flattened by flat, hand. Like we go like fold it in half? No, you take, we have some, we'll, we'll show you. Oh, this is all about wulong, but we're, we're jumping into green tea. Now, so. I feel like I had some last time. Um, it was really young and it was, <laughs> it's really young. Well, it's 2008. It's 2018. It's like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was really. It was a young like the oh yeah, it doesn't like that. Oh wow. Look at that. JK. So that big, big, big leaves. Typing Hokwe. This is all about so oolong, folks. Okay. We're talking about green tea. Um, but just to get in terms of a really, really dramatic tea shaping, um, they're taking. Yeah, it's nice, right? Um, it smells somewhat reminiscent of um, like fishing. Like fishing. Like fish, yeah. 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 <laughs> like bluegill. <laughs> mm -hmm. how, how do these taste? They look good. It's a green tea. But it doesn't taste good. It looks like more. Yeah. Yeah, it does. <laughs> these are the same. Like you were saying, I forget the actual. Like Million yep. Yeah, so they're the same thing. They're yep. just different, I guess, like subsets. They're they're different uh, cultivars and different varietals. Okay. So how you branch those off and how you take a leaf and then you propagate it to sort of bring out certain traits. It's kind of like a show dog, yes. you know. Yeah. As you take a show dog, like we didn't originally have pomeranians. You know, Pomeranians, if you go to the forest Maybe of Pomerania, just... they're not naturally running through the forest. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that was the case. <laughs> but, you know. That would make my day to see a herd of Pomeranians <laughs> in the wild, like chasing down like a squirrel. They but to that point, I mean, do you find that, like, the like the farms that you visited, like, are yeah. they trying to be like innovative, or are they really just trying to stick to like traditional? Techniques? Some do, and that's a great question. So, when I was in one of my trips to China, I went to uh, I didn't go to the farm, but I went to a, a guy who owned the farm and he was selling it, and he was selling um, shui xian, which is traditionally a tea that comes from wu yi shan. Um, it's a large, usually twisted leaf, and the leaf itself is actually pretty close to getting this big. I almost brought an aged shui xian tonight. It's one of my favorite teas. Um, they're very big leaves. They're actually, they're close in shape and size to this because this cultivar is very similar to that. The one that grows in Anishan is very close. Um, so what they did with this leaf is instead of leaving it twisted and you know like this little twisted black dragon they folded it and they folded it into a into a square and then they wrapped that tightly compressed folded square of tea leaves into a little white envelope and they said each one of these little squares is good enough for a pot of tea and i'm like huh 
I guess that makes sense, and I guess by doing that, it helps to facilitate the aging of this tea if you ever wanted to age it, that sounds great. And also, one of the reasons why they did it is because Xuexian is apparently one of the older uh, forms of tea. And when you think of Fujian, and when you think of old tea, your mind kind of drifts off to the Tang and definitely the Song period where you had near Wuyishan, some of the original sort of uh, uh, Gongting teas, uh, tribute teas, and those were compressed into cakes. Whether they be big cakes like that big crazy thing right there behind you, I wouldn't drink that other than the fact that, it, I mean, it's, it's made of tea, you could drink it, but it's a presentation thing, you know, it, it's viable tea to drink if you ever wanted to, but it's not meant for, hey, I'm going to break this big coin of tea. Um, but back then, the idea was that you'd take that, uh, it's up to you, I'll, I'll hold on. Um, the, uh, the cake of tea would be broken up, it would be pulverized, and then it would be turned into that matcha-like substance. Um, they were like, well, let's do that, but it's more like a pour, and that you can take that chunk and put it in a teapot and break. And so they were being innovative, you know? Now, yeah. does that innovation mean good tea? I don't know. Personally, I think going back to, I forget who said it now because I've had a lot of tea, but um, <laughs> you know, it's like, is it better to do a lot of things or one thing? And it's like, well, if you can't get the one thing right, it's going to be hard to do the other things. So it's your choice. Do you want to do the one thing right? Or do you want to do a lot of things or try to innovate when you can't get the one thing right? And that's always going to be a problem, whether it's a problem with Chinese tea making or, you know, trying to fix the subway in New York. So, you know, it's, it goes back to a very human need to either innovate or toe the line or really perfect something that has already been put in for, you know, before you. Um, it's, it's a choice. What do we think of this tea? I think this is my favorite tea. I, was, uh, I think this is my favorite tea, but this is my favorite tea. Yeah. So. Um, Rosewood. Rosewood, yes. yes. Um, you get a lot of these sort of incense wood notes coming through in this tea. This tea is about 70, 75% oxidized. Um, this is Wu Yishan. Um, this is uh, Da Hong Pao, which is one of the Se Da Ming Song which is the four famous bushes from uh, Wu Yishan. And this is one of, this is probably the most famous tea to come out of China. When you think of names, again, the first question that we had to my, what's in a name? This one, the name itself refers to a moment in history when mythologically, I think, there you have a scholar going through uh, Wu Yishan. He stays over at the monastery that's making this tea and you know, he's sick, he's going through trying to either save his mother or he's trying to pass a scholar test, either one. The story branches off and becomes different things, but... It's from 1980. What? The, the no, this, no, 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 we'll save that to the last. Um, no, this is from this year, but um, the name comes from the guy who's so happy that the tea helped him to pass the test. He wraps his red robe around it, thus it's big red robe. Um, and it's, it's a very classic Ming style tea. So, we'll brew it one more time and then I'm gonna brew you a crazy tea. Is this ours? Yes, this is yours. This is yours. This is coming straight to you from the source here in the Floating Mountain Tea House, Merck's West Side. Tea Tuesday night. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's okay. it's really amazing because when different people make it and you're using different vessels to make it and you oftentimes get different results with the same tea or mm. even the same quantity of tea or even the same water. Yeah. That's really interesting. Mm. That's what I want to touch on.
yeah. of him, like catching fish. Yeah. Like, like that's it. <laughs> it's like so strong. Like the memory, mm-hmm. like the set memory. Yeah. It's like your sense of smell is directly connected to <laughs> yeah. your memory, and it yeah. doesn't go through the amygdala. I believe mm-hmm. that's why oftentimes you might be walking down the street and you smell something, it just hits you. Like, yeah. what is that? You yeah. Know? More so than like your sense of sight or your hearing. Yeah, everything yeah. else is. And all like the weird cultural implications because I don't have any experience. Yeah. That, right? <laughs> so sometimes like I'll smell, like, I'll smell like tea. I'm like, oh, this smells like an old Buddhist temple. My yeah. parents used to force me to take it too. I feel that way, but if I, t- if I tell you, yeah, like, yeah. I have no idea. Where yeah. Talking, so. I'm like, you mean a fishing boat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but both sound very relaxing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was someone who came in here drank tea and was like, this reminds me of my grandmother's house. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that a lot of it comes from childhood memories too. And yeah. I, I have a theory, and that is, when we're young, we're essentially born super tasters. You know, like, when you ask a kid to eat a, a thing of raw broccoli, they're going to turn their nose and go like, that thing's crazy. Yeah. And it's because broccoli is kind of crazy. You know, or a raw tomato. When I was a kid, I did not want to eat a raw tomato. Nowadays, I'm okay with it. But back then, it was just like, I couldn't handle it. It was too yeah, much flavor. I'll have that too. So, it's, I think part of it is just that we're, we're born super tasters. Um, when you get into, uh, even like, what is it, the perfume industry. Famous perfu- perfumiers of France, when they, when they began the job, they began... Actually, they're supposed to end, uh, begin very, very young, usually around 11, uh, historically. And that's because you're training your nose to not. Um, because by the time that you peak, is usually around 15, f- uh, 15, 16. As a, as a worker? As a or super taster. Oh, okay. And after that, it begins to taper off. Gotcha. So. Oh, is that fine? <laughs> <laughs> and then you retire at 16. You're yeah, it's amazing. Like, uh, <laughs> what a career. Yeah. This tea got sweeter. So we're going to brew one more tea. Mm-hmm. This is good. Um, and we're all going to fly home afterward because we're supercharged on the tea time. Yeah. We're brewing a non. Yishin pot, because I like to mix it up. Hey. Where are you? (laughs) Glazed. Yes, it is glazed inside and out. And the choice behind this was slightly difficult. I have a teapot that I've dedicated to aged teas, and I love that teapot, but I, it's been a long time since I've brewed the tea that we're going to brew, and I want us to taste every flavor that that teapot, or that tea has, and so if you brew it in a glazed teapot, it's like putting it up against a mirror. All the flavor comes out. None of it absorbs. And so I'll have to skillfully brew this because in a pot like this, I'm not going to pour water over the top. Instead, what I'll need to do is superheat the pot before the tea goes into it in the hopes that uh, hopefully we get some flavor. And the reason why I say that is because the tea that we're brewing is from 1980. Um, This is a Dongding, which again, we've been brewing a lot of Taiwanese oolongs tonight. Um, This is a very famous Taiwanese oolong. Dongding is Nowadays, when we think of it, um, a lot of people think of a very bright, very medical, very uh, crisp tea. But back in the 80s, that was not the case. Dongding was usually a higher roasted tea. Um, it was a tea that a lot of people would actually age. Um, and so you would hide it away. Grandma and grandpa would put it in a jar and hide it and not drink it until they were like, you know, a little bit older. Some of the oldest tea that I've ever had in my life, which was maybe 80 to 120 years old, was of this style um, and was, you know, just what grandma hid away, you know, and somebody found it years after grandma died and they're like, what, 
is going on. Um, this T, I believe, so as T ages, and, and you all have been asking questions about this, as T ages, you can do one of two things. You can either let it age and let it do its thing. And that means at the end of the day, at the end of its life, it will kind of be like a poor. It will kind of age, it will become earthy. It might take on some of the external flavors if you didn't pack it so well. Um, but ultimately it's gonna quiet down and it will settle. And it will be, you know, after 30 or 50 years, uh, a shadow of what it used to be. And the flavors that remain will be that of, well, well, we'll see maybe in this, but you'll get some like medicinal flavors. You'll get some, maybe some like dry plum flavors. Um, but it doesn't taste like tea after a while. Um, the original tea flavor that was in there is long gone. Some people, on the other hand, will re-roast the tea. Um, throughout the tea's life. Usually once every five years and sometimes once every 15 years, depending on what sort of flavor they want to preserve. And you do small roasts. You don't usually do a big, crazy roast. And the reason you do that is to preserve and balance the flavor. So those old sort of mucky flavors that might get in there are burnt off and you're preserving a sweet flavor. Um, it becomes less complex over that time, but if you do it right, you'll have a nice layering of roasting, similar to how this tea has that layered flavor, that first, uh, that tea of one year that we had. So, now as for what this is, is it roasted, is it unroasted, I think we're gonna have to just kind of find out right now. Mm -hmm. And that's the joy of enjoying tea. Um, I think I might just put all of that in there. Um, so what we'll see in this is an older style, and this is what I love about older teas, is that we see an old version. This is us opening a book and asking the question, how did they make that tea? And if you look at it, this is coming from Taiwan, this is coming from Taiwan, this is also coming from Taiwan. It's a difference of 38 years. All right, these are made this year, this is made in 1980. And you can see quite a difference. If you look, I'm not gonna pass it around because this like, likes to go off on the other side, but you see a lot of stem, which is fine. They were okay with that at the time. But look at how the tea is rolled. Compare it to how it's rolled today. Very flat. Very flat, kind of folded not really rolled per se, it actually looks a little bit more like this. Yeah, it's like a marriage between the two. Yeah. So what this tells us is that back then, they were not pellet rolling tea, not so much at least. And it's really, it really points to, this is handmade through and through. Uh, it's pointing to also a type of leaf type that you don't see that much in Dongding right now and that is this bigger leaf um and it looks a lot like almost like a shui xian i have some aged shui xian it almost looks like that so we'll see there we go what's it glazed with no, it's, it's, so it's a style in Chinese um, ceramics that we call, uh, say this is Ding Yao style clay. So it's it's sort of a proto porcelain. Yeah. Um, before porcelain, you had a lot of different types of celadons, and then you also had things that had um, a sort of porcelain esque base to it. I'm also not going to rinse this. Um, so it's, it's of that. And when I first picked this up in a random ceramics shop that was actually selling large basins for putting fish in, wasn't actually selling teapots, I, I convinced them to sell this to me, um, it was pure white. It looked like somebody had just kind of dunked it and here you go. 
um, over use, over time, it's begun to crackle. And you'll see that as I turn this over, look at the base of it. Yeah, it's always like cracked. Yeah. Um, it's the same with these cups. These cups were pure white when I got them, and only was it through use did they begin to receive that crackling. And even these Korean punchan sagi cups that we have sitting in front of uh, U3, if you look at them, when I first received them, they were dull gray. Over use, they've become slightly crackly, and a sort of blush pink has emerged from them. How long did it take to get your first um, crack? Almost instant. Almost instant. It's the heat that will do that. And then the tea oils enter as it seeps through. So let's give this a go. I want you all to, when you are ever given the opportunity to drink a tea that's older than you or close to, the age of you, or, you know, born in the same sort of decade, per se. Who knows? I'm not going to assume anything. Um, what I want you to do is appreciate it, again, as if you're kind of reading a book, as if you're opening that book for the first time, and read it. Really dig your sensory facilities or faculties into that. 30 years ago, this would have been much more intense. 30, 38 years ago, right. in 1980. Um, it would be different. It would probably be more like this, this Tiaguanyin that we had. I can smell it from here. I don't need to lean down, but as you lean down, and look how the color is slightly different too. How there's actually a gradation, not necessarily caused by the the concave nature of the cup, but actually that there's a slight uh, density. density to it. Some areas have this sort of swirl to it. Sorry, video audience, you can't it see this. It has a cooling nature to it, too. Big yeah. time. Yeah. Big time. Tea in the sort of spectrum of yin and yang is yin. Unless it's a pour, and a well-made pour, because those are tend to be more neutral. As a tea ages, though, uh, it can become very yin. So. Okay. It's like smelling menthol or something. I get drywall out of it, but like drywall. I love the smell of drywall as a kid. Really? <laughs> like my parents have fish basements on the drywall. Like, I can't even tell you what drywall smells like. Yeah. We need to look into that. It's so <laughs> It's probably healthy, you know. It's like asbestos ridden or something, but that's so awesome. The there's the tart finish. Yeah, the tart finish. Yeah. Yeah. No. And like what you said about mm -hmm. getting quieter, like all of the the things that stood out, I guess outside of the flavors, mm -hmm. aren't really there. It's much more like flat. It's less pointy, but it's broader. It's like, it has more depth to it. Mm -hmm. It gets starts in the middle. Like, it starts differently in the middle. It's kind of different when you swallow it. It's kind of different. Because yeah. it starts tart in the middle. It kind of gets like neutral and then it ends kind of like, it has that sharpness to it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like a blue cheese kind of, right? When you eat there's, it. there's a slight little blue cheese kick that's sort of like crystal y. Yeah. Um, the the tongue tables. The yeah. 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 Um, I don't know if anybody's had those smoked, I think they're smoked plums. You find them in Chinese medicine stores, apothecaries. They're like an old time snack where they take a plum or a date or an apricot, I forget what they do, or long yum, uh, dragon's eye. It's like a lychee or lychee, um, and they'll smoke them. <coughs> And they're sweet, but they're tart, and they're also like have a slight smoky finish to them. And that's kind of what I'm getting. Here. Yeah, definitely that with like long on. Long on, yeah. yeah. Tastes yeah. like burnt dust. Like burnt dust. Okay. There's probably quite a bit of burnt dust in this too. Um, my my theory behind this, and I'm curious what everybody else thinks, is this probably was re-roasted multiple times over its life. Mm. And there might have actually been a re-roasting at one point with Nolnyan wood, which is pretty common 
um, and can be quite common and was quite popular and still popular um, in Taiwan to roast and re-roast something with little can wood. And the reason is, is that it's a, it's a dense fruit wood. And so you get a slight little fruit kick to it. Yeah, when you usual. smell the cut, you smell like a lot yeah. of roasted fruit flavor. Yeah. Uh, no, it definitely smells roasted. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like it's also like if you've had orange wine or any wine that's like really oxidized. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. A lot of that going like the one you wake up the next day and like, <laughs> yeah. what's left in the bottle. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. It's like, like it's not necessarily like the flavor, but more so like that. that yeah. Feel. Yeah. yeah. So normally, I don't know if I, normally when we're doing this online live thing, we answer questions for people who are online. I'll do that later. Um, There's a few. There are a few? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So having... what kind of tea was the last one? Which this last one? one. <laughs> um, that one, it doesn't have a time necessarily. It's okay. I'll, um, I'll, I'll recap for everybody. I said, can we so. see the leaf? Um, can we can you post the name of the folded tea. Okay. And then um, I'm drinking with you an old oh. growth red. This is a yes. red, red tea. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and um, also, <laughs> yes. What was the also? There was somebody that joined watching. Um, um, Grace Martinez. Oh, hi, Gracie. Um, so, all of this. And, and those questions are great, and this is looking crazier and crazier, more like a red wine at this point, or like a, a tawny port. Yes. For those. Well, speaking of Portugal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. With these older teas, can, yes. can you get like more pores out of them? Yes. Yes. Typically, yes. Not always, but I will say this one probably, yes. Um, to, to just make everybody both here and and online and also when we have future audiences because I post these on, on the YouTubes. Um, I'll always put a list of the teas that we tried um, down on the sort of like description, this description box. Um, this will usually show up much later in date on my blog somewhere with more like poetic notes and like, you know, uh, positive affirmations and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, you know, just to kind of run through the lineup of what we tasted, we had our, our, our two 2018 Taiwanese teas. This was a Ali Shan, the very, very first one. Um, very green, maybe 25% oxidized, 20-25. Um, we have our Tie Guanyin, also made in uh, Taiwan and beautifully made. Both of these come to us by way of Tillerman Tea in uh, Napa, California. Um, next, we had some beautiful teas from this beautiful establishment, uh, Floating Mountain Tea House in Manhattan's Upper West Side. The first of which was a Lao uh, Yo Hua Xiang, which means old, uh, mellow flower and it's old because it's coming from an old tree in this case it's a 350 year old tree which is pretty old um, and a lot of these are coming from trees that were much older than that so they're taking it and they're grafting it um, next we had our Da Hong Pao uh, from Wu Yishan um, the most oxidized of all of our teas tonight this is probably about 70-75% oxidized uh, and then finally, we're rounding out the night uh, and our journey um, with this 1980s uh, Tongting, uh, which is coming from Nanto County in uh, Taiwan. Um, and is very, very, very nice. Um, and again, probably brew it all night, all morning. Uh, the flavors so, are really balanced. It's, yeah. 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 And, and to what you had said earlier about the sort of burnt dust, I think had we had we rinsed this tea, that probably wouldn't be it. So, if you want. I'm, I'm done after this, though. Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> Done. Um, so, so if anybody had, yes, sorry. Oh no, I was just like, I was gonna touch the teapot. <clears throat> you can touch the teapot if you want. Um, uh, it's hot. Um, we'll leave a touch. So, if you have questions, whether it be tonight or in the future, um, you know, feel free to ask when this is posted on YouTube. Feel free to ask on Facebook at uh, Floating Mountain, uh, their Facebook page. Um, we do these educational nights fairly regularly. Um, there was one month where every week I was doing one, and I was just like, maybe that's a little bit too much. But um, on we different like flavors, right? Like you like oolong, you like all things. Okay. It was we did history in a bowl of tea, where we recreated tea recipes that went back six thousand years ago up to today, all in one three-hour tour. So it's. Um, it can be very, very focused. It can be very, very broad. Every Sunday we do a meditation here. Um, every uh, Saturday starting next year, we're gonna be doing Qigong here. Um, every day with the exception of Tuesday, which is why I like doing the events on Tuesday now, because um, we're closed on Tuesdays right now. But every day they do Chinese style Gong Fu Cha. So if you ever are in the city and you wanna do Gong Fu Cha, this is a great place. Um, one of a growing number of places in New York City that you can tap into this type of tea culture. Um, and one of a growing number of places in the United States. Again, I mentioned uh, West China Tea Company's Guanyin Tea House in Austin, Texas, and Thea Tea House in Portland. Um, you have Far Leaves in uh, Berkeley, California. You have Imperial Tea Court in San Francisco and in Berkeley. You have uh, Hidden Peak in Santa Cruz, but they are few and far between still. And Tivana all over and the country. And Tivana all <laughs> over the country. So they went out of business. <laughs> they went out of business. So, um, Did they? I, I think so. You might find them in their mall near you. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Maybe. But, you know, it's. Had I been asked the question, could you find me a Chinese style tea house 10 years ago? I would have said, you're crazy. You know? Um, I'm from the Bay Area. So I, okay. I, my family and I were in Chinatown pretty much like yeah. once a month. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. This was seen as like an old people thing. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. And, and so even my mom's age, she was like, she's like 55 now. She uh -huh. doesn't really touch traditional Chinese tea mm -hmm. because. You know, it's like she deems as past her generation yep. because we've just been so busy in our modern world. But yep. it's kind of cool seeing this because you got a lot more younger people like interested in it now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's I mean, you go to China today and you see people do this too. But China's a little different because if you have one percent of people doing something in China, you have like millions of people doing it. Yeah, you have like <laughs> ten million um, people doing it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, whereas you know here you have a. You have cultural filters that it has to kind of pass through. Um, and also, I, I used to work in Chinatown at, at Red Blossom mm -hmm. um, on Grant Street, middle of Chinatown. And you'd have, you'd see that generational divide. You'd see people who came over who grew up doing this, largely because they grew up in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And Hong Kong, you have less of that divide, per se. But then you had folks who came through the Cultural Revolution, and they're like, I don't even want to touch it because it's... It's, you know, traditional, Yeah. you know? Um, and then you have the kids who were like, mom never let me do this. You know, that teapot was up there because grandma gave it to us and I wasn't allowed to play with it, you know? Um, so it's, yeah. the pendulum swings, it swings back and forth. Um, but it, it's nice that it's a more global thing. Because even for me, like I'm Vietnamese, and yeah. Vietnamese people don't touch, don't do this yeah. very often at all. Yeah. You know, we have a coffee culture. Yeah. Like, um, condensed milk. <laughs> yeah. My friend made me Vietnamese coffee. Though. Only for women too. Apparently, men only drink straight black. You know, when oh. it comes out from that drip. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Like, the yeah. scholar style. Yeah. The little drum dripper. Yeah. But like, yeah. Delicious. What's the, yeah. What's the drum dripper? I don't, I'm calling it something wrong, but it's, it's, it's that filter you put on yeah. top of the cup that you pour the hot water in. It's actually made of steel. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Oh, yeah. like, okay. So it's like an instant brewer, but <laughs> the coffee that they use is like an you know, always been bland, super yeah. rough coffee. Yeah, that's what she had. Yeah. She had it from Cafe du Mont. Yeah, Cafe, yeah, <laughs> Cafe du Mont, you know, like, like an <laughs> orange jar. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's essentially like drinking like four cups of espresso at one time. Yeah. Oh, right. oh. I don't know how it came to be that way, or what, I don't know the background, but yeah. like, uh... I yeah. enjoy it a lot, because like Vietnamese coffee has a lot less acidity to it, mm -hmm. it's what I'm partial to, mm -hmm. but I can only take like a tiny sip, because I'm like... <laughs> yeah. When I started drinking in college, I would just fall asleep, like after what cup, because, and I Your couldn't figure out why, yeah, and I realized that I, I had a caffeine over, over yeah. Oh, and you were just like... Yeah. And after a while, I just kind of like built... I learned to drink it a lot slower. So that's the trick, is that they put mm -hmm. all the ice yeah. and you let it drip there, but you're not supposed to drink a, like a frappuccino. You're supposed to like sit there for an hour, talk to your friends, do this and that, and then slowly enjoy it. Mm -hmm. and, but yeah, it, it's, it's nice that even with the younger Vietnamese generation, like we're getting more into like these traditions because I think given the past, world yeah. yeah it's nice to slow down and yeah. enjoy it like this yeah, yeah. I, agree. I agree and it's nice that we can find it in an urban environment and we can learn you know how to slow down ourselves which yeah. is you have to teach yourself how to do that sometimes <laughs> you know it's not readily available to us these days so well i want to thank everybody for coming um i want to thank everybody who watched on this uh amazing little device we're looking at um, and if you have questions again feel free to reach out to me um, my blog is scott t that's s-c-o-t-t-t-e-a uh, dot wordpress dot com um, you can send a message to me that way um, if you want to see that little slideshow again because there's way too much information to just kind of delve into um, I might make it available I don't know I'm, I'm tempted to turn it into something a little bit more structured um, and a little bit more comprehensive because I've done this style of tea talk now for about 10 times. So it's almost the length of a book at this point. Um, so we'll see. But I, if you ever want to learn more about tea, this is a great place to go. Um, and there's a lot out there, but the best way to do it is by actually sitting down and drinking tea. So don't. Don't ever replace just being online and learning about tea with actually putting tea in front of you and actually learning how. Direct experience is always the best way. That's how you learn how to brew tea, but that's also how you learn how to taste tea. So, um, so yeah, thank you all again. Um, I'm gonna try to turn this off somehow, but thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>